lines, Chair. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Councillor Alan Law, Chairman of the Review and Scrutiny Management Commission. Uh, members of the Commission present this evening are councillors. I think we have a, a little bit of an echo going on here. Do you want me to uh, hold off until? Okay, fine. So I'll keep going then. Uh, in the Commission tonight are councillors Adrian Abs, the Vice Chairman, uh, Dennis Bennyworth, Jeff, Councillor Jeff. Brooks, have I haven't seen Jeff? I've got him down. It's coming. Chairman, he is uh, sent his apologies. He has. He's an apology, is he? Yes, okay. I'm afraid so. Okay. Uh, uh, Councillor James Cole, Councillor Tony Linden, Councillor Steve Masters, Councillor Zabiki, and Councillor Tony Vickers. Uh, we have a number of other members in attendance. Uh, Councillor Lynn Doherty, who is remote. Uh, Councillor Owen Jeffrey, who's in the chamber, Councillor Jeff Mays in the chamber, Ross McKinnon, I see in the chamber, uh, Councillor Richard somewhere I understand is remote, Councillor Howard Wollaston is remote. Have I missed, have I missed anyone? And Councillor Dominic Bowick, thank you. Oh, and Councillor, <laughs> and Councillor Aldor Walter, thank you. Oh, I was hiding behind. Hello, Caroline. Councillor Culver as well. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I have, uh, I have council. Uh, I still got this echo, by the way. Oh, Somebody's Beck, Jeff Beck, Councillor Jeff Beck. Hello. It's a, uh, it's it's a dynamic environment. These notes I've got were valid from earlier this afternoon. Uh, so who's who's making this echo? Was it? Could could everybody put their um, laptops on mute, please? Mute. How's that? Oh, that's much better. Fine, good. Uh, I've got council officers present. I've got Nigel Lynn, the chief executive. Uh, Sue Halliwell. Uh, Sue Halliwell? Sue's not here either. Well, he's not really out of date. Uh, Joseph Holmes, did I see Joseph? Yes, Joseph, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah Clark, who I know is not here. Uh, Eric Owens, I don't think is here either. Um, we really got to get these notes up to date in future. This is slightly embarrassing. Uh, John Wynn Stanley, I know John is remote. He told me he was going to come in. Uh, Pete Campbell, Head of Children's, and Catherine Macken. Uh, and I would like to go on to welcome two guests who are here to help us tonight uh, from Thames Water, Richard Aylard and Nikki Hines. And I'll ask you to introduce yourselves later on. Now, before I, we proceed with the actual formal uh, business tonight. And it's with great sadness, I think, that many of us learned yesterday of the death of Stuart Clark. Uh, now, Stuart has been known to many of us. And in fact, as I was just reminded, made a major contribution to one of the papers uh, for later on this evening. Uh, I don't intend to uh, uh, have a minute silence or anything. I think we can probably do that. Uh, if we're going to pay our respect, maybe at the next council meeting or, or executive, I just simply, I think, if you'll allow me to record uh, our appreciation for Stuart's work and contribution to the council over a number of years and uh, send our condolences to his family. Okay, thank you. Right, Gordon to my left here is the clerk for the meeting and the meeting has been live streamed by YouTube and Tom Dunn. Tom is the, uh, the Zoom host. Now, before I, we start proceedings, I'd like to explain a little bit of administration for the benefit, particularly of members of the public who may be watching. Uh, tonight's meeting has been held over both Zoom and with councillors present in the meeting room. The meeting has been live streamed also on YouTube, so members of the public are able to follow proceedings. Uh, and please can I ask everyone participating in the meeting to make sure they switch off their microphones, which I think has now happened. Uh, speak directly into them when asked and uh, to speak them off, to switch them off again when finished speaking. Uh, if we do hear the evacuation alarm this evening, it's going to be for rail and we must leave the building immediately via the emergency exits over to uh, the left. The assembly point is the Dolphin Car Park. If the, uh, lock, we will, if the lockdown alarm sounds, we will remain seated and await instructions from officers. We'll adjourn the meeting until such time as is safe to proceed. Do members understand all of that? Any questions? 
No, well, fine. We shall therefore uh, move on to item one, apologies. Do we have any formal apologies, Gordon? Uh, yes, Chairman, we've received apologies from Councillor Jeff Brooks and also from Councillor Claire Rolls and Councillor Dennis Pennyworth is substituting for Councillor Rolls. Thank you very much. Uh, now, minutes of the item two, minutes of the previous meeting held on the 24th of May. I take it we've all seen these. Do we have uh, do we have any comments, any feedback, any comments before I ask for a recommendation to approve? Biki, you meant you called me today with a comment. Could you put your mic on, please? Yes, I did, Mr. Chairman, because um, I was out of the country at the time and I was trying to get a substitute, but fortunately I couldn't. But my apologies wasn't recorded because I wasn't able to send one. I think B was concerned about being regarded as being absent. We he had communications problems and getting an apology in, but uh, I think we just we just noted that uh, for, for this evening. Thank Unfortunately, you. you'll be officially down and still as absent. Thank you. That's the way to go. If there's any any other comments on the on the minutes, if if not, could I have a proposer to accept them, please? I've got Councillor James Cole, and I'll second it, uh, Councillor Linden. And just show of hands, please, everyone in favour of accepting the minutes. Okay, that's done. Carried. I'll, I'll sign those after the meeting, uh, Gordon. If you don't mind. Okay. Actions from the previous minutes which is item number three. So we need to go on to page 21. Do you want to make any comments, Gordon? I don't think there's any further updates, Jim. Uh, well, I, I think I'd like to make the, the, the comment, I thought you were going to make it, about number 62. Because uh, number sixty-two was not how I understood the meeting to have left, to have left the actions from the last time, and uh, was it says it will be uh, we'll have an update on the council's employee appraisal system in the next financial year. Uh, what we're going to have it is we're going to have it at the next OSMC meeting, as as originally requested, and that has now been agreed. Yes, thank you. Okay. So I go into item four, declarations of interest. Sorry, Chair, I just had one small comment. I noticed that the Chief Constable had come back with the statistics that we asked for, and glad that he did. It basically shows West Berkshire in a quite good light. So I don't know if people remember. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Councillor Vickers, should you hand up as well? Yes, I don't know whether you're using the Zoom hand or the physical one. Uh, can I... you please use the Zoom hand? And if you don't, okay. yeah, if, no. you, if, if, if I don't react, Start with yeah, yeah, as well. I did, yeah. uh, Item 58, I wondered if we knew whether the uh, Kennet Navy Canal Partnership was going to reconvene. I see we've appointed somebody, but do we know if and when it's going to meet again? I have no idea. Does anyone know the answer to that? Go on. Uh, I, I can probably provide a little bit of information, Chairman. Um, we have made the request to uh, re reconvene the partnership uh, that's been made to the former chairman of the partnership. And uh, we've also made engagements with other local authorities. To date, we haven't heard anything back. We have tried several times, but there doesn't seem to be the same level of interest with other authorities. Okay. We, we wait and see. Uh, okay, I'd like to move on then to uh, item four, please. Uh, any declarations at all relating to the items on the agenda? Has anyone got in? Councillor Vickers. I suppose um, if we're talking about flooding, um, which might come up with Thames Water and with the uh, other item, um, I've just been um, nominated, voted on as a chair of the Newbury Flood and Drainage Action Group, as we like to call ourselves but we haven't met since we made the decision to form. <laughs> okay, right. Noted. Baby. I, I used to work for Tim's Water a very long time ago. Okay. If that matters. <laughs> fine. Anyone else? Okay, fine. Thank you very much for those declarations. Uh, ne next is petitions. I, I'm not aware of having received any new petitions. Okay. Thank you, God. So now move on to item six. Be before I do, uh, have we got a very full agenda today? 
Uh, and I really want to give priority to this particular item tonight on, from Thames Water, the, the presentation and the, 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 the uh, I know there's a lot of uh, members or a lot of interest and interesting comments and questions to, to be asked. Um, it's also tonight's the first time we're bringing in the quarterly financials to OSMC before they go to executive. So I want to make sure that we give that a priority. Uh, so I've agreed with the, uh, the, 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 the deputy the, the chairman, vice chairman, and I've agreed with the officers that we may actually defer one or two uh, of the, the items tonight. And uh, if, if we do, it'll be in the uh, following sequence. The, well, I can remember it anyway. I can't find a note. Um, it'll be uh, the economic development strategy. We will we will try and have a look at. Uh, we will certainly do the corporate parenting, uh, the economic development strategy, and the flood uh, strategy, strategic update will be the two that will uh, fall out and go into the next meeting if uh, if if that's required to, to 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 meet the timetable for tonight. Okay. Well, with no more to do. Uh, Thames Water, uh, welcome Richard and welcome Nikki. They're going to uh, present uh, a presentation that I think you've all got a copy of. Uh, perhaps they could explain who they both are and what their roles are, that would be helpful. Uh, let's go through the presentation. Uh, we have sent them a number of questions, which I hope they will be able to address during the presentation. And then going to invite questions from uh, both OSMC members and from other members of the council uh, who, as per the Constitution, have let me know that they wish to ask questions. So, without any more to do, may I hand it over to Thames Water. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Richard Aylard. I'm the Sustainability Director at Thames Water, and in that capacity, I lead our external engagement on healthy rivers, and obviously that's a particular preoccupation uh, at the moment but I have been a member of the executive team for 20 years and I will do my best to pick up the other questions as well. If I can't, I can't answer anything, then of course we'll take it away and we'll get back to you in writing. But it's been very helpful to have questions in advance and I hope we're reasonably well prepared. Uh, before I start the presentation, just ask, I'd like to ask Nikki to introduce herself too. Thank you. So I'm, um, I'm Nikki Hines. I'm part of um, Richard's team. I'm a local government liaison officer. So I do the stakeholder engagement with councillors and MPs in South Thames Valley. Thank you. Right, so if we could start the presentation, uh, we, we've tried to address, I, I'm gonna speak about 15 minutes in this, in this presentation. So going through this quite quickly, I know you've seen the presentation in advance. And we've tried to pick up on the key uh, issues which we were notified uh, as being of particular interest to the, uh, the scrutiny committee. So if I go straight on to improving river health, which of course is a concern for, for everyone at the moment. Um, and the uh, headline there is that we've made a commitment to a 50% reduction in the total annual duration of spills across London and the Thames Valley by 2030 and within that, an 80% reduction in sensitive catchments, which will include the vast majority of the watercourses in, in West Berkshire. In addition to that, we have tested a new system whereby we will make live notifications if we have an untreated discharge at any of our 468 permitted sites. Uh, we've tested it at six sites around Oxford, and we're now going to roll it out across all 468 uh, by the end of this year. And we're the first water company to make, to make that commitment. And we do it for two reasons, really. First of all, we think it's very important that people who want to um, go into the water or close to the water, so fishermen, canoeists, um, wild swimmers, uh, paddling children, should know when there's been uh, a discharge. And secondly, we want people who are watching carefully and wondering what's going on, to know uh, well, when they should be asking us questions about what's, what's happened. So it's an important step forward in, in transparency. We're also very committed to working on a catchment basis. So you'll probably know that each of the main river catchments has a catchment partnership. And uh, one of the big problems there is capacity building. 
Uh, we want to engage with them on lots of things. Uh, they, need, they need training, they need funding, and we've put, put up a £5 million contribution actually from our shareholders to work more closely with those catchment partnerships. And then if we get back to the, the, the core business, we're making good progress on delivering £1.25 billion programme of improving our sites between 20 and 2025. And I'll come on to some of those uh, in a minute. If we get to the next slide, please. We're absolutely committed to protecting and enhancing rivers. I'm a freshwater biologist myself. Uh, my colleagues are wild swimmers, canoeists, kayakers, fishermen, bird watchers, and everybody at Thames Water is very uh, committed to the natural environment. And under the leadership of our new chief executive, we have changed our line on untreated sewage going into rivers. We used to say, yeah, this is really unpleasant. We don't like it any more than you do, but that's the way the system was designed and sometimes it's inevitable. That doesn't wash anymore. And we are now very clear that any discharge of untreated sewage, even when it's permitted, is unacceptable. And so we are working really hard to, to make it unnecessary for us to discharge uh, untreated sewage, although from time to time, for the time being, that is going to be necessary, and that's where those uh, targets come in. But eliminating discharges completely isn't going to be quick or easy or inexpensive. inexpensive. That's the way the system was designed to operate, and it, it works as it, as, it, as it should. So we're going to need a lot of support from our customers, uh, from our regulators, um, at, 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 and from local communities to get where we want to get to. And we are really keen to work in collaboration and partnerships with communities and, of course, with risk management authorities as well. If we go on to the next slide, I've just put a map there which just shows you, gives you an idea of the scale of our operation in West Berkshire. Each one of those is a sewage treatment works. Uh, some of them, like Greenham Common, are tiny, treat the waste from two or three hundred people. Others, uh, like Reading uh, and Newbury, of course, are much larger. But they are all, and there's a list there on the right, I'm not going to read them all out, you're pleased to know, but they are all treating waste uh, from residents of West Berkshire. But I would add that when you look at the map of the sewer network, there are lots of white areas where we don't have any sewers. And that, of course, is where the residents are on private septic tanks. Uh, and I would just say that in terms of river health, it's really important that people do who are on a septic tank, first of all, know they've got them and there are people who don't. And secondly, that they maintain them properly. So we'll do our bit, but we need other people to do theirs. So if we go on to look at investment, we've been doing a very thorough review of our business performance, looking at strategic direction. And we're now right in the middle of developing our plan for the next five years, 2025 uh, to 2030. And um, we are uh, building that with close links to our engagement uh, with customers uh, and with stakeholders and with local authorities. And we'll be consulting on that plan much more as it takes shape over the next year or so. But if I look first look now at what we're doing from 2020 to 2025 on the next slide. Um, there's a list there of all the things that all the, the major things we're doing. So if we start with wastewater monitoring, one of the issues in the past is we haven't known as much as we ought to have known about what's going on in terms of discharges, whether the flows arriving at the works are, are, are more or less than they, than they need to be before we discharge. So monitoring is going on at a list of works there. Um, then at, at Boxford Works, we're going to be um, working to reduce phosphorus and, and ammonia, which charges to very sensitive watercourse. Burfield also, um, phosphorus and sampling for a chemical called nonal phenol, which is a surfactant, which has been found in the area. We need to make sure what the levels are there. And similarly, at Cheveley, um, we are again going to get phosphorus down and monitoring chemical removal. On the next slide, I'm sorry, this is quite a, a long list, but I thought it was important we should spell out what we're doing in each of these local areas. East Shefford, phosphorus reduction, um, Hampstead Marshall, new flow monitoring equipment, Leck Hampstead, catchment wide actions to improve water quality, to get nitrates down. Um, Pangborn is a chemical of concern called triclosan, which was in the first um, generation of bacterial wipes, but it has long-term problems. So we, the levels do seem to be going down, but we're monitoring that uh, to see, see whether that is actually the case. And at Reading Sewage Works, we're doing a wider 
chemical monitoring program in conjunction with the Environment Agency so that we know uh, all about the, the trace chemicals which we wouldn't otherwise be, be monitoring for. If I move on to Newbury, very important works for, for us. Um, we're upgrading the London Road pumping station, a uh, huge increase. We can currently uh, pump 340 litres a second. When that's finished, we'll be able to pump 800. Um, and as part of that, we've rehabilitated the old ductile iron section of the London Road rising main. A rising main is a pressurised sewer. They're uh, uh, really sensitive. If you burst a, a rising main, the sewage doesn't just dribble out, it, it pumps out. So we have to get, have to get that right. Um, and uh, we're also replacing the other rising main. So that whole area is having an upgrade. And then finally, we're also, because of growth in the area, we're going to be uh, expanding Newbury sewage works. That's still in the design phase. That needs to be done, not least to cope with the 800 litres a second that's going to be arriving from the London Road pumping station. So all that fits together, both network and treatment. If we go on to the next slide. Um, over the years, some of our works um, begin to reach the ceiling of their treatment capacity because the catchment's growing, climate's changing, urban creep, more runoff. So sometimes we need to upsize the treatment process with a big capital scheme, but equally there are sometimes smaller things that we can do which will improve the situation more quickly and effectively. We call that go to green, and we're looking at East Shefford, Hungerford, Kintbury, and Pangbourne for that. So that'll give us a more robust treatment capacity for maintaining compliance. But when we look at what's causing the discharges in the river, it isn't actually the sewage. People aren't taking more showers or flushing the toilet more often when it rains. What is happening is the rainwater is getting into the sewers. And that's what's causing these overflows. So getting the amount of rainwater into the sewers down is, is really important. And it's a particular issue in high groundwater areas. So if we look at the next slide, please, we, we have identified across our area a total of 56 um, areas where groundwater has a real impact on our system. And you can see that there's a list of about 10 there in, in, in West Berkshire. And what we're doing there is we're doing really detailed surveys um, to work out where the water is getting in uh, and what we can do about it. In some cases, it comes in from the top through manhole covers. In some cases, it infiltrates uh, from the side. And in other places, there have been uh, cross connections made between the surface water and the foul sewer, which shouldn't have been made. So all of that work is going on in this five year period. And we're looking to make a big submission to Offrot uh, for reducing infiltration in the next five years. Um, but we've already started work in two um, particularly sensitive areas, Compton and Hampstead Norris, which are on the next slide. And these groundwater, nice catchy name, isn't it? Groundwater Infiltration Management Plans. They're all available on our website. And there's a picture there of the cover of the one for, for Compton. So I would encourage people to take a look at those and they'll be able to see what we're going to do. So if I leave wastewater there for a moment to get on to investment in clean water, um, we're building a, a new contact tank. That's an additional cell for after Nervit water treatment works, give ourselves more capacity, more resilience there, which is, which is necessary. We're going to be putting in enhanced treatment at Speen Water Treatment Works, um, Cascade aerators at Pangbourne, Playhatch and Speen. And we've identified 11 and a half kilometers of water mains that need, need renewing. We've done 3.1 so far. We'll get the rest done by the end of this regulatory period. And finally, we're refurbishing the Snellsmore Tower at a cost of over, over a million pounds. I know there are some questions about the planning process and our role, and I think it's it's important that we are people understand that we're a, a specific consultation body for local plans. So we have to be consulted on local plan documents, and we use that opportunity um, to help us plan strategic infrastructure. But we're not consultees for third party planning applications. So we have to work closely with local authorities. I have to say the liaison here is very good in West Berkshire. So we look at the local authorities' weekly lists, and there's a third party planning facility that tells us when there are applications that ought to interest us. So if we go on to the next slide, just at the bottom there, you can look at the things that we, we assess when we get notification that there's going to be a third party planning application. We look at the flows, connection points, 
uh, records and we look at the performance of the local pumping stations and sewage treatment works. And if we're not happy, then we notify the local authority and we work with the developer and we, we uh, generally come to an agreement whereby we can get things uh, to a way that works. There is a problem in that developers still have a statutory right to connect to the sewers, whether we like it or not. This is something that was outlawed in the 2010 uh, Water Act, but it has never been enacted. So 12 years later, the housing developers have managed to persuade the government not to enact this important legislation. So we're, we're still putting pressure on, on DEFRA as other companies, and they have said that they will, will look at it again. I hope they will, because it's, it's quite important. In terms of water efficiency, uh, we're limited in what we can do to persuade developers to build water efficient houses. I mean, the, the government rules say they should be built to either 125 or 110 litres per head per day. Uh, and we're busily telling the government that actually that's not what, what happens. But we've pretty much given up on regulation to force developers to build water efficient houses. And we're now going for a carrot approach whereby we're actually offering them a discount on their connection charges if they build water efficient houses. So you can see on, on, on there, um, if they'll build new properties with low water using devices, they'll get a discount. The full discount is 1,800 pounds a property, which is enough to make their eyes light up. Um, and there are smaller discounts for smaller benefits. And we're going to be rolling that out quite widely um, because we think it's one of the ways to get water consumption down where we don't have too many levers we can, we can pull. One of the issues that's a lot of concern to the public at the moment is chalk streams, issues that concerns, concerns us and me as a fisherman. And we've committed that we'll do a flagship project on the River Pang to show what can be done to improve a chalk stream. We've got one that we've been working on for some years on the River Chess, that's going very well. And we've, we're working in partnership now on the River Pang. And you can see there we've identified high level risks and issues, all of which are things you would, you would expect. And if we go to the next slide, you can see the um, building and monitoring plan uh, and uh, working on a strategy which we will then uh, seek to get funded through our next business plan with, with Ofwat. We've got good steering group workshops going on, including landowners, farm clusters, and the NGOs. We've done some site walkovers, and uh, we've got a, a board meeting in October to review catchment strategies. So if anybody would like to know more about that, please please let me know. Uh, we're we're very, very, very pleased with it. And finally, uh, on this section, we have published a plan which shows what we are doing to reduce harm to water quality in the catchment. It's on our website under the River Health section. And again, happy to take any questions on that. It's quite a, a long document. There's a two page summary as well. I know you wanted me to talk about leakage and I am more or less at the end, Chairman. Um, Leakage in West Berkshire in the last six months, obviously really important or more important than ever when we have a host pipe ban in place. Um, 881 leaks repaired, uh, of which um, more than half were visible from above ground, but others weren't. We have to detect them using acoustic equipment. Um, and there's been a lot of maintenance activities on the network as well. Um, I did want to highlight one particular incident uh, on the next slide. Um, because it shows the way things ought to work. Some of you may know about this, this um, burst main uh, on Friars Road, Newbury. Um, we were told about it just before midnight on the 8th of August. Very smart work with the council meant that we had a permit granted for work on the 10th. We did all the work in one day, reinstated the site, and by the 11th, uh, things were back to normal. That's what we aspire to do all the time. And I have to say, it makes it a great deal easier when we have good liaison with local authorities so we can get traffic management in place quickly uh, in and out, benefits your residents, benefits our customers. So those are the points that I, I picked up and um, very happy to take uh, questions on, on that or indeed anything else. Yes, thank you very much. I, I see I've got a few hands already coming up. Um, what I'm going to do tonight, I just, we, we, I know we'd sent you a number of questions. You did, yeah. Uh, I spent a uh, considerable time just reading through those, and I've also had a few people call me and ask me, could they ask questions? They seem to fall into, if you don't mind me summarizing, into three categories. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the first category deals with discharges yep. and the sewage. You know, what are we doing? Technical use to reduce what technical technology are you using to reduce mm. them? Uh, maybe questioning whether they're even being recorded accurately or not. So that's that's the first discharge. Second uh, theme seems to be capacity of the system, yep. uh, and in particular, you know, when we add new development, any significant development like North Newbury, like Compton, like Thiel, uh, we have questions on that. And what are we doing about that? Uh, which probably goes into the planning aspect. And a third one, which I noticed your presentation didn't really touch on, uh, so I'm going to go there first, is that flood alleviation and the priority of flood alleviation. Uh, so what I'd like to do, uh, members of OSMC and, and, and members of the council who, who asked to speak and question, I'm going to do it alternatively. Uh, so I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to give Councillor... Uh, Steve Arthur Walker, the first shot at uh, at a question or a comment, and because I know he has to leave uh, uh, before the meeting's finished to go to another meeting. So, Steve, if you would like to go first, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and um, thank you, um, Richard, for your interesting presentation. Um, so, again, I'm the portfolio holder for the environment here at West Berkshire. Um, without wanting to go through our strategy, um, we do have a five-point plan which has been in place uh, for the last more than two years now, priming, of course, on carbon neutrality and many of the themes which you touched on. Um, healthy, uh, healthy communities and, and healthy environments and so forth. Um, one important plank, though, of our five planks of our strategy is really resilience for climate change. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the water dimension, yeah. this relates to flooding. Um, I'm keenly personally aware that the, of the, the huge impact which the 2007 floods make in Thatcham, as well as uh, other areas which have, have been affected uh, more recently. And um, while I, I appreciate you, you would have come here with, with your, your, uh, your views of what we would want to hear about, I'm concerned, as indeed we are corporately, about the perceived lack of focus uh, on, on sustaining improvements in flood risk management. And again, I, I, I make no apologies to, to be fairly factum centric here, as, as, as we're one of the worst affected areas. Um, so in particular, while, while we welcome your, your support over the long term for the uh, uh, Thatcham uh, Flood uh, Surface Water Management Plan, uh, and, and again, appreciate your, your, your investment in earlier parts of the schemes, there was one recent scheme, um, which, uh, and again, our, our Service Director for the Environment, John Wynne Stanley, who, who incidentally is online here tonight, can, can, can and will follow up for you. Um, but we've been very disappointed uh, that you seem to have wipe the slate clean in terms of flood protection. It's almost as if your sense is uh, that job's done and, and yes, we've got lots to do and leakage is important and so <laughs> forth. Could you fill in a gap uh, briefly here now, please, on flooding and how you're going to help not just Thatcham but other communities um, be prepared and be less affected by future events such as this. Thank you. Excuse, just before you answer that, I think Councillor Sumner had a similar question. Uh, Richard, I see you, you're online, you had your hand up. Was, uh, have you anything to add to that? Uh, no, mine is actually closer to the uh, street works area, Chairman. Okay, fine. Thank you. I'll come back to you then. Okay. okay. Right. Well, I'll start by saying my house was flooded in Graisley in 2007, and I was out of it for six months. So uh, um, I'm very sympathetic to, to, the, to, to the problem. Uh, there's a lot of planning going on in, in, in Thames Water to, 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 to tackle the known problem areas. And, and that does go hand in hand with looking at the potential impacts of, of climate change. So I certainly hope we haven't washed our hands of, of Thatcham. I don't think we have, and I'm very happy to look up the specifics and get a meeting together and discuss what, 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 what we can do. The, 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 the problem is that we do only have a limited amount of money to spend on a, any aspect of our business, and we have to prioritise according to where the need is greatest. So we have an established methodology of the number of houses that have been flooded, how often, how much, and that then allows us to, to get to a, 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 a fair priority ranking so that we're not just doing the areas where the, the locals are shouting loudest, but where the need is greatest. And that's sort of overseen by the, by, by, by the um, Consumer Council for Water. But there is a lot that we can do, um, particularly to encourage um, sustainable drainage. 
which will just, it won't take the water away, but it slows it down. And if it slows it down, as you know, <laughs> as you well, that's what, that's what sorts, sorts the problems out. So we are upping the amount that we're spending on, on sustainable drainage. And we're really keen to work in, in partnerships because if, 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 if we see a need, council sees a need, maybe a business need, sees a need, we can, we, we, we can get the cost benefit to work for all of us and get the scheme going. So I think what I would say there is, there are, if there are specific areas of concern, uh, please let me know and, and I will get some dialogue going and we'll explain what we're doing or if we can't, why, why we can't. I think we should be very clear about that. Thank you. And again, we look forward to a follow up on that. Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And I'd probably bring John Winstanley in later on and let other mm -hmm. topics flow, but yep. to, to come back with some specifics on that, uh, Mr. Howard. Uh, Councillor Masters, you were the uh, you were the first of the OSMC members. Put your hand up. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, uh, Richard, for, for your um, briefing. Um, Mr. Chair, through you, Chair, um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, you, you talk about the um, you know the having to prioritise where investment is yeah. um, and have a ranking structure. Why? Why has investment in capacity, which is one of the things that you cited as, as being the one of the challenges mm -hmm. for for you um, at the moment, and hence your your um, your plans that you've outlined with us today? Why has that lagged behind so much? Why have you had, you know why why has it all come to a head now when you've had thirty years to invest in the network? If we're talking about capacity in the network. Uh, we, we do invest in the network as there is new development uh, and we invest uh, in surge treatment works capacity as well. And what we do is we, we watch the, the local area, we work out what the population equivalent is that we're going to be required to treat. We get that information from, from local plans and we always aim to have headroom in a sewage treatment works, which then gets gradually eroded over time, and then we build it a bit bigger, and then and then and so, so on and so forth. And that means you never get a sewage works that's much bigger than you need, but you've always got some spare capacity there. Occasionally, we will get overtaken because some development will happen more quickly than we thought, or, or we realise that we ha had some calculations wrong. But very often, it isn't the development that's causing the problem, it's the surface water. So when people say, oh, there's a new surf, it's a new development coming, it's 200 houses, how are you going to cope with the sewage? If we just get the foul flow, we can cope. The problem comes when the development is poorly designed or poorly executed, and we get the surface water as well, because you've got tw a twin sewers. You've got a, a foul sewer, which is very small, and a surface water sewer, which is very large. So I'll give you, if I give you, give you an example. A, a patio, six metres square, not huge, but substantial. If that is, that should go to a surface water sewer. If that's connected to a foul sewer, then in, a, in heavy rain, and it's only in heavy rain we have a problem, it'll put as much water in the foul sewer as 120 homes. So these cross connections, misconnections are really, really important. And it's the surface flow that we absolutely have to avoid. That's what's causing the problems. And as I say, sometimes it's poorly planned development and that's up to us and building development and, and others. But we also, not actually in West Berkshire, but in a neighbouring county, we found a couple of instances recently where the developer put in really nice plans, uh, which we were perfectly happy with. They then, they then subcontracted out the work and the subcontractors made the cheapest possible connections, which ended up putting surface water into foul. We didn't find it until two years later when we had some very, very heavy rain and we had to do some detective work to work out why our sewage pumping station was overloaded. So there is a real difference between the surface water and the foul. And by, by and large, if we just get the foul flow, we can cope. So is the oversight system that we have in place nationally and locally, is that fit for purpose? Is that, is that where we're falling down? I'm not an expert on this, but what I hear from, from people, from, 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 from planners and, and, and other people on planning committees is that some of this um, building design approval is, is contracted out to third parties um, and it's done by looking at the plans and it isn't nobody actually goes and looks down the hole and makes sure it's been built the way it was supposed to be built. And that's a ridiculous generalisation, of course, but that does seem to be where, where we have problems. It's because the execution has been poor. And what are Thames Water doing to ensure 
that things improve well, on, on, a, yeah. I mean, on a lobbying. You mentioned yeah. that developers seem to have a better handle on yeah. getting their message yeah. across and allowing legislation to be delayed or whatever. Yeah. I mean, the what are you doing? The, well, the 2010 Floods and Water Management oh. Act removed the developers' automatic right to connect to our systems. But that legislation, the secondary legislation to enable it, it's, on, it's in the Act, but it's never been brought into force because the, because the government decided not to bring it into force, we believe, because of lobbying from the, the, the house builders. So we have been working with councils, uh, with MPs uh, through Water UK um, to lobby DEFRA to say, you've really got to bring this in. It, was, it also brings in SUDS approval bodies, which, again, is another really, really important thing. So we would you know, encourage you, perhaps for the local government association or others, to say section three needs, needs, needs to come in. But we do keep up. We generally do this at an industry level rather than because it's more effective than just one company. But, but we are the biggest. Um, and uh, and the, the, the areas where we have the biggest difficulty is where we have these high groundwater levels. So that's where these groundwater impacted system management plans come in, trying to go back and find patios that might have been built 20 years ago, but are still giving us 120 houses worth of flow when it rains. But it's, it's not easy. I'm not going to pretend it is. You know, each, each individual property uh, ultimately needs, need, needs to be looked at to make sure it's properly connected. Okay. Thank so, you. so do you see that, Steve? Can I just? Uh, there's a lot of other people. If, if I, you know, we may get, we may be able to come back to you. But thanks. Uh, uh, I've got uh, Councillor McCrow. Oh. Alan, if your uh, your mic's not on, okay. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had some difficulty uh, getting it unmuted. <clears throat> yes, yeah, and it's about uh, modest. Uh, uh, award specific issue, um, the server that serves the western side of Thiel has been extended and also serves some um, villages that as far as uh, Old Boston. And a few years ago, the local, the local pumping station got severely overloaded. And at one time, there was a convoy of six uh, tankers all queued up uh, pumping out the, uh, the, the, the pumping station, uh, causing a lot of disturbance to the local residents um, but we now have outlined permission for uh, almost 430 homes to be built in this area and I was wondering what uh, plans Thames Water have to improve the, uh, the sewage network in the area. Yeah, we're particularly concerned about this one because we have had problems with our Lambfields pumping station they've sometimes had up to six tankers queuing to pump it to pump yeah. it out to stop. Yeah that's the one yes. So this, for, I've got 429 dwellings on my, on my notes. We are aware of it. And there's a joint effort between our modelling team and our operations team to investigate the current state of the network so we can understand what we need to do to offset the flows from this site. So we're not going to be happy to just accept them. We've got to make good plans in good time to make sure that we can cope with that. And our systems modelling group have done an initial study for growth across the whole of Thiel because we know this is a, a difficult area. So I'm um, happy to put you in touch with the team if you'd like to talk to them direct, but we are definitely on the case with that one. Um, hence, it's in my notes. Okay. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alan. Do you also have the uh, potential development at North Newbury in your notes? Because one of the members who, is, who didn't ask to speak tonight, but did mention, I think on a question sent to you, that they were concerned about the connectivity of yeah. that major development. Is okay. that all? Yeah. I, I, and while I'm on that, yeah. uh, Compton, because right. uh, okay. sitting we... behind you is the, the member for Compton. And, uh, right. Uh, <laughs> similar questions. Okay. So for the North Newbury site, which we understand to be the Taylor Wimpy da David Wilson home site known as Hilltop, I hope that's right, um, works to accept the whole development are still ongoing. We're liaising regularly with both developers to understand their build and occupation rates and ensuring our works are completed in line with this. Um, we met a parish councillor, Mr. Thomas, earlier this year following a blockage in the network, um, but we think that was a one-off and we don't have concerns upstream of Deanway sewage pumping station. We're focusing on the downstream network. For the medium to long term, we're going to be upgrading that pumping station. And in the short term, we're looking how we can make sure that the downstream network is free from debris and silt. Um, the section along there is particularly flat, so it's prone to operational issues. But I think the headline message is that we're working with the developers to understand what they're planning to do and make sure we're, we're ready for that. And if I whiz through to Compton, 
Um, I was really concerned to hear that a family had had in, um, limited toilet use for 120 hours. Sorry to be sort of my back to you, but I hope you can, you can hear. Um, but we'd like to know um, if we could have more details of that so we can look into it, because generally um, the longest promised time we would give for a blockage would be 72 hours. And if there's external flooding, it would be 24. And usually it's quicker than that. So something does seem to have gone badly wrong there. Um, in Compton, um, the, we've, do, we've, we've done um, 380 meters of leak tight lining. We've sealed manholes and we've got um, connections to be sealed and patch repairs to a previously lined sewer. Um, which should help with the uh, the infiltration and high high flows in in the in the area, um, and we are looking at the new homes plan for the Animal Health Institute site as well. Um, so we we agree they shouldn't be occupied until we've got the de detrimental issues sorted out. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, I've now got uh, Councillor James Cole from OSMC. James, thank you, Chairman. I'm a Hungerford and Kimbury member. So yeah. as you've mentioned, Hungerford and Kimbury and yeah. Hampstead Marshall and mm -hmm. Oxford, yeah. delighted to hear that some money is going to be spent. A couple of questions, if I may. Uh, one of my Kimbury residents, commenting on the fact that you're going to record discharges and report, um, he's wondering about whether there's an independent verification process. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, the event duration monitors record the discharges and we report that to the Environment Agency every year. In terms of independent verification, the Environment Agency can come along and check our records, they can, they can come and check the equipment anytime they would, they would like to. Where we have local concerns about whether the kit is reading, because these, these ultrasonic uh, sensors and that they're, they're, they're quite quite sensitive we are actually putting in uh, webcams so that um, and we, we can then give a link to local people so we've got one i went to talk to mortimer parish council earlier this year and there were and there are i've got concerns about the edm at mortimer whether it's recording properly um, I think it's probably over recording. They think it may be under recording, but there's a webcam in place now. Uh, and when you look at that, you can see there hasn't been a discharge since May, but there was a period last month uh, when things got quite full and you can see the EDM level going up and you can see the, the webcam. So if there are real concerns about Kinbury and if it's based on anything, I'm happy to put a webcam in there. Okay. Thank you for that one. Um, Chairman, may I ask one more? Go ahead. Uh, the other thing came my way was leak repairs. Um, awful lot of leaks have been mounting up. And you've given us some figures, and they may well be impressive. Hmm. But how do your figures compare to the actual numbers of outstanding leaks? How hmm. long is it taking you to get leaks repaired? Well, I can I can give you a, 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 a I, I can write to you with, with 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 the exact information of how how long. Certainly, the average time to repair leaks is is going down steadily. The, the there, there there are two particular problems. One is that when you find the leak at the surface, it isn't just a question of digging straight down. That water may have gone several hundred meters underground before it appears at the surface. So you've got to trace it back. And that requires using acoustic devices that aren't much use during the day when there's a lot of noise. So you're working at night to find out where is the, where the actual leak is that's causing the water to come out at the surface. The second thing is that a lot of leaks are not visible at the surface, and it's the bigger leaks that aren't visible at the surface. So again, we have to use acoustic techniques to find to find those. But having said that, there is a huge amount of work going on to get leakage detection and repair times down. It's something we've, we've hit our leakage target three years running. Um, we've got more work to do. Uh, nobody's remotely complacent, particularly with a, a hosepipe ban and poss possibly another dry winter. But if you'd like to know about detection and repair times, I'm happy to give you a, um, a written reply on that. Well, Kibbury and Anborn, for example, I can think of leaks that have yep. been outstanding for, well, years, I suppose. 
down the road. Okay, well, I'd like the to Kimberley know. One, I think, may now be being fixed. Certainly. Okay, well, well if, if we have up. got those long standing leaks, do please let me know so I can absolutely check that it's properly recorded and being looked at because um, there are also, I have to say, and I'm sure this wouldn't be the case where you are, but there are sometimes when we dig down, we find that this isn't actually a leak, it's a natural spring, and we can test for that. So, mm. but I'm not using that as an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, Councillor Jeffries, on. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, the question I have is to do with the Thatcham Water Treatment Works, which you mistakenly call the Newbury yes, Water Treatment Works. <laughs> um, we, we, we take everything from Newbury as well as our own. Um, I'm well aware that uh, what's meant to happen is the water goes in there, there is storage facilities, so the splash flooding and so on, the water can be stored, mm -hmm. but it is treated so that it's potable water when it comes out the other end and goes into the River Kennet. I'm aware that there was an instance where somebody, I don't think they were ever caught, illegally put uh, some kind of poisonous chemical into the drainage system. Mm -hmm. So it just ended up coming into the factional treatment works mm -hmm. uh, with the result that there was uh, non-potable water coming out. And because it had been raining, I believe that it was then actually going into the River Kennet. Mm -hmm. Where do we now, that I, I, and I am yeah. I'm going back about probably 10, 12 yeah. years, something yeah. of that order. Yeah. We've got just a bit of a misunderstanding there in that the treated effluent from our sewage works is not potable water. It's still, it's, it's, it's possibly clean enough to drink. You, you might not get yourself ill if you did. I'm not volunteering to try it. Some of our sewage works operators have done it from time to time to demonstrate to people how good it is. But it has still got, seriously, it's still got bacteria and it's got viruses in. So uh, it's, not, it's not potable. Uh, it could be cleaned up again to, 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 to be potable. The issue we have, you're quite right about poisonous chemicals. Um, but what, what gets impacted is the river rather, rather than human, human health. The issue we have is that we, we, we have what is called a public sewer network, and there are lots of manholes, and I'm afraid there are unscrupulous uh, companies or perhaps individual tanker drivers who've got a load of something that they ought to be taking for proper disposal, which will cost them money, and they would much rather drive up to a manhole cover near to a pumping station at four o'clock in the morning, discharge into it and drive away. And I had one reported uh, very recently uh, to me, uh, and we're, we've actually got our forensic, we have an, an ex-police inspector and a small team who are now staking this out. It's not in West Berkshire, but um, yeah, the, these things happen. And when they do, you know, our sewage works are configured to deal with pee, poo and paper. That's it. You know, we don't want your wet wipes, we don't want your nappies, you don't want your underwear, you use use tea towels and we particularly don't want any chemicals um, so there's a serious problem because what comes in from can, can can kill the biological treatment in the works is done by done by the bugs and if they get killed there's no treatment it goes into the river and we've had incidents of varying degrees of severity so if anybody ever sees anybody discharging to a manhole um, please let us know but it'll likely be the early hours of the morning um, if I may, Chairman, uh, that was precisely the point that I was trying to make, is that uh, we've got a precious resource like the River Kennet, yep. and since I know for a fact yep. that this yep. has happened once, well, yep. are we in a position to be able to say that we've got enough storage capacity that we can handle an incident like that without it spilling into the Kennet. Mm -hmm. Because again, all these chalk yeah. streams, yeah. none of them need to have this kind of if damage we, in them. If we knew that something bad was coming in, we would divert all flow to the storm tanks. And that would give us between two and 12 hours storage, depending on how much, how much rain there had been. And that does give us a chance to um, uh, reseed the process, sort out what's going on, then pump back. The problem is that sewage arriving at the sewage works isn't routinely sampled. It's actually really difficult to do that. So it tends to be only when we get a report from one of our sensors in the sewage works that says the bugs aren't happy or levels are rising or falling that we send someone down and then we find there's been a problem. But to illustrate just how bad this, this can be, we had an incident a few years ago where um, a chemical called chlorpyrifos, which is used for control, controlling worm casts on golf courses, um, was, dis was, was discharged via a, a drain, arrived at Marlborough Sewage Works, uh, and wiped out 
all of the invertebrates down several miles of the of the Kennet. And we, we tried to trace this back to see which one of our pumping stations it might have come via. Uh, it, it was too late because it had all been flushed away. But when we got the experts to work out what the likely volume of chlorpyrifos was, it was one teaspoonful. Correct. So, you know, this is just how serious some of this stuff can be, and particularly some of the pesticides that specialists like you know, greenkeepers use. And the only, only rain down the drain is a, is a really important message. Okay. Thank you. If I may, just once more, uh, Jerry. It's better be a quick one. It, 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 it's a very oh, a small one as well. It, it, is to, it, is to, it is to say that I do think that you need a Thames Water to look at having greater storm storage facilities mm. just because of this kind of issue. Yeah, yeah. I know it's happened once, and I don't want to be there when it happens yeah. a second time. Yeah. Point taken. Thank you. Councillor Abbs. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, actually, the first thing I'd like to do is uh, thank Lee Dillon, because obviously he brought this forward originally and, and while we're discussing it tonight, and he, uh, you know, he's obviously no longer vice chair, but uh, I know it was important to him and it's important to, to pretty much everybody in the room, I think. That's mm. the best attendance I've seen at OMC that I've, I've gone to so far, at least in my memory anyway. But uh, um, I do have a few questions and I, I did send it well ahead of time. Uh, it was to do with the technology side of, of what you're what you're doing. I had split that into five questions, but it sounds like the five questions didn't actually make it to you. But fortunately, you did answer a couple of them as you went through your presentation. So that's good news. Um, I were particularly interested in the, the technologies that you're applying, because what I've heard is that you're going to upscale. Well, there's more people. So, yeah, that, that's not a surprise. Yeah. It's good to hear. Um, I heard that you are going to try and stop as much uh, water, you know, for the rainwater going into the system so that you've got a better chance to, yep. to deal with what comes. Yep. But what I didn't hear was how you were going to go about reducing the massive energy usage that um, sewage works yep. have associated yep. with something. Yep. How are you going yep. to decarbonize right. okay. yep. from that route? How yep. you, you mentioned um, talking about phosphate. Mm -hmm. um, PFAS is the term in my head to do with all the man-made chemical stuff, but yep. you can tell me I'm wrong. I could easily be there. Um, I'm interested how you're dealing with those, you know, mm -hmm. Are you dealing? Are you looking at things like hydrothermal decarbonisation to completely change the way yeah, that we yeah. deal with sewage, yeah. or is it simply a matter of we'll polish this, we'll polish that, yeah. we'll grow a bit, but basically for the next few decades it's what we've had. It's a, it's a bit of both, right? So <laughs> we're using basically we we use natural processes to process. The, the sewage. So we 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 put the the, the good bugs uh, and, and we put air through it and we keep the temperature right and give the conditions and and they then deal with what is coming into the works. They reduce the ammonia level. They reduce the nitrate. They reduce the phosphorus. Where the carbon comes is what we do with the sludge. So all of the solid material that settles out when, when, when the sewage arrives at the works and what also settles out when the bugs have eaten it, the two primary and secondary sludge, that all gets uh, collected up and it gets dewatered and it then gets taken to one of our sludge treatment centers. And there, what we've done, we've always done anaerobic digestion back to the, the 1930s, which is, you will know, is a relatively simple process. But we've now got a new front end on it. We, we use a thing called thermal hydrolysis. And this gives you a sort of a pressure cooker type effect on the, on the sludge. And the sludge, of course, is made up of, uh, of cells and the, the, the steam bursts the cells. And that then you, means you get 15% more energy. So by moving the, the sludge to these sludge centers, using thermal hydrolysis, then our anaerobic digestion, and then dewatering, we've got a very high quality product, which the farmers call cake, um, which we deliver to them. Now, the next stage beyond that would be some sort of thermal destruction. And I think we will probably end up doing that for two reasons. One is because when you get the sludge, you've got all the, a lot of the nasties out of it, but what you haven't got out of it is, is the microplastics. So we are, you know, without deliberately doing so, but we're building up microplastics on farmland. But thermal destruction would get rid of the microplastics. It would deal with any antimicrobial resistance or, or any, any, any pesticide residues. And it would also give you um, a lot more energy. But the capital costs of doing that and doing it on a product that's as variable as sewage um, are huge. 
So we've done some experimenting, we're working with other companies, and I think that's a next stage. But in the meantime, what we're doing is we're optimizing the energy use of all our sewage works to use less energy and generate more, because like everybody else's power bill, ours is going through the roof. So in addition to, to generating uh, energy from sewage sludge, we're doing floating solar PV uh, on, on, our, on our reservoirs. We've got land-based PV. We've got some wind turbines. Uh, and we're, we, we, we basically make 25% uh, of, of our own energy. And some of our sites are actually self-sufficient in energy and export it to the grid. I have to kind of tell you how pleased I am to hear that you're solving the energy side. I'm sure Steve Ardar Walter will be very pleased as well, because that will go towards our West Berkshire target. So thank right. you very much for the answer. Thank you, Councillor Abs. Uh, Councillor Sumner. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and yeah, I'd like to join in the thanks for the presentation this evening. There's certainly been some information shared that's uh, of great interest to all of us. Um, I did first of all want to just um, again thank you to Councillor Ardar Walter for his question with regards to the flood alleviation schemes in Thatcham. Um, it is disappointing that after 14 years of working together, we're going to end up with a programme that isn't complete. And I do use the word programme um, with great emphasis, because what we need to make it all safe um, is, is for the programme to be completed. So I look forward to the information coming through um, following that, that question earlier. Um, fundamentally, though, my, my point that I wanted to raise is around highways and street works um, and performance thereof. Um, the presentation appears to imply that everything's going very well. Um, there are no issues or concerns. Um, indeed, it's just been said earlier on that um, the reflection on page 23 is actually how things ought to be done. Um, but I think our officers, my team, um, as portfolio holder for planning highways and countryside, um, and our residents might beg to differ with that, pos that position. Um, what we appear to receive is a somewhat fractured um, process, dare I say uncoordinated process, uh, which is prone to delays uh, and to which the, the outcome is performance concerns. And I know there are ongoing conversations with regards to that performance. Uh, but Chairman, through you, what I'd like to ask is the views of those present this evening uh, to ensure that these concerns firstly are recognised um, and secondly, that they're receiving um, an appropriately high level of focus to address the matters, because um, I'd be very concerned if prioritisation was being weighted towards uh, supply chain or profits over performance in line with the needs of the authority um, and of our residents. Yeah, well, I'm sorry if I gave the impression that everything was perfect. Um, I didn't mean to. I included that particular clip of the, of the, of the leak repair simply as a positive note to, to end on and because we had had particular help in getting the traffic management sorted. But uh, streetworks is a problem for us everywhere. Um, uh, we, we, I'm sure we aren't as good at it as we should be. I'm very happy to broker any discussions between our streetworks team and the council if that would be helpful. And I'm happy to look at any, any individual um, issues that 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 might crop up. Um, we do have to, I'm afraid, dig up dig up the roads um, and disrupt residents. We try and do it for the shortest possible period, and we try to comply with all the all the regulations. Um, it honestly isn't a matter of of, of profits or or cost cutting. Um, we, our shareholders haven't had a dividend in the last five years. Don't expect anybody to cry uh, bitter tears at that. Um, but it is a fact that the money isn't going out of the company. It is being, being reinvested. Um, and it's, it's well known amongst my operational colleagues that Streetworks is always an area where we can and, can and must do better. So I, I accept the, the reproach. And as, but as I say, happy to look at specific cases or broker a general conversation with the councillor. Happy to get that arranged. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Very much. Just let me give you a little bit of an update. I've got Councillor Vickers, Councillor Oloko, uh, Councillor Mays, uh, Councillor Bennyworth, and then round again to Councillor Masters. So, uh, Councillor Vickers, Tony, off you go. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I'm used to following and generally agreeing with Councillor Somner, although I'm his shadow, thanks to highways and planning. Uh, my background is in construction that did my first degree 50 years ago. This uh, building patio was so putting in uh, building patio as well. <laughs> well, yes, it was building patio. Yeah, so nobody worried about suds in those days. Um, now, I've now got a, a 2,000 home development in my ward, Wash Common, 
which I mentioned in my question yep. to you. And that has huge implications, obviously, for Thames Water and for the rest of Newbury and indeed Thatcham, because the sewage is all going to end up down there uh, via the London Road. So my questions are really all linked back to Sandleford, which uh, certainly half of the development is now approved. We'll go ahead, yeah. although I haven't heard anything since the appeal was um, upheld. So water saving is really the theme. Yep. Here you have a large development which naturally would flow into the River Enborn catchment, yep. which is going to flow into the Kennet, uh, which is going to be a significant load on the whole sewage system. And if you can keep the water supplied to those homes to a minimum, mm -hmm. surely um that will help everybody yeah. downstream yeah. so i mean look totting up your potential carrots 1800 pounds a home comes to 3 3.6 million in in cash to the developer mm -hmm. if you can persuade them yeah. my question is i've seen other local planning authorities that can actually put a policy of a lower supply rate into their local plan yep yeah. um how does one do that how could we do that because it's a tr tr strategic site, so it could be embedded in the local plan. Um, and also, because it goes through another very important site for this council, which we actually own, the London Road Industrial Estate, will you be needing more land take? And because any storage involved with your uh, mm -hmm. developments yep. on your sewage station are going to require groundwater, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, um, a volume of ground underneath, mm. Could you perhaps expand on what the implications are right way through to Thatcham sewage stage for that development and how you can minimise yeah. the water supply? I think in terms of managing water supply, how this council could bring in tighter rules. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know, but I can, I can find out. I can put you in touch with somebody who could, who could help you on that. Um, we certainly want to reduce per capita consumption. Uh, as sharply as we can, because if we can reduce the capital consumption, we then don't need to build new reservoirs, water transfer schemes. Um, and it, it takes it takes the pressure off the future with climate change and population growth. So we're as committed as anybody to getting uh, water use down. Um, I think you suggested that we might have an incentive to sell more water. I'm afraid the regulator is wise to that one. There's something called the revenue correction mechanism that means that if we sell a whole lot more water, we don't get any more money. We actually get penalised. And if we sell a lot less water, uh, we don't lose out. So that's that, that, that is is taken taken account. Um, we have to work through 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 the planning system. But it, I think that the, the key that I would be thinking uh, two things. First of all, I'd be saying, look, this is a new development. This is where we should be using grey water recycling. We should be having a dual potable, non-potable system. If you or I decide we want to do grey water recycling, it's a bit risky and we might not buy the right bits from B&Q and it might not work and it would leak. But if you've got 100 or 200 houses, you can, you can collect up the water from the washing machines, the, 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 um, 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 the dishwashers, um, and the showers, and, and you can connect, collect it all up, give it a little bit of treatment so it's not grey anymore, so nice white porcelain doesn't, doesn't get discoloured, and people can then pump it through their houses, they can use it for toilet flushing, they can use it for car washing, they can use it for watering gardens. And that's, a, a, that's one of the things we'd like to be encouraging through this um, subsidy to developers. So then we get less water going into the into the sewers and we have to provide less water which is really important the other point then is to make absolutely certain that we don't get any of the surface water so we want to see really good um, surface water drainage new drains being built uh, sustainable drainage if necessary to slow the flow down and all this is best done at the planning stage and that's why we do work with developers i'm not sure what we're actually doing in that particular location um, but 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 in general, we do try and talk to developers, and we do try and make sure they're doing something sensible. And as I say, we're now trying to incentivise them as well. Thank you for that. I won't take up any more time. Actually, I have other questions. But thank thank you for that, uh, Councillor Vickers. I've got uh, Councillor Mays, Jeff. Yes, thank you, Chairman uh, Richard. Thank you very much for taking my notes last week but i've got one question which needs to be asked and it's probably pretty quick uh, thames water have indicated that surface water is overloading the mortimer sewage works mm -hmm. um, please indicate where that water is entering the system 
or is it being recycled through the um, water which is coming from Foudry Brook? Have you any ideas on that one? I'd have to write to you on, on that, having talked to the local team, but my understanding is it's simply infiltrating into the, into the sewers because the sewers are, are, are in, in wet weather. So I can tell you that Mortimer Sewage Works discharged 34 times in January, February, March, mostly for 45 minutes to an hour. It hasn't discharged since March. So, oh, you know, glad about in that. The, it, it, so it's the weather and it's the, it, it's, it's the water levels, it's the saturated ground that cause, ca causes the problems. But we are, as I think I mentioned earlier, we are checking out the monitor to make sure it's recording yes. accurately. And that's where the webcam comes in. And if those numbers are right, it will go on to our list of high spillers uh, and there will then be a programme of reducing infiltration, exactly as we're already doing in Burfield. So it's, we're, not, we're aware of the issue. I don't think we know exactly where the water gets in because that, that works will have tens of miles of sewers coming into it. Um, but we will, we will be finding out. Fine. Thank you very much, Dave. With regard to Burfield, I haven't yet even found the sewage works. I could have tried and locate that one. I'm so sure, I'm sure we, we might come back to you for that. It's not a secret. We can tell you where it is. Thank well, you very much. It's clear you two are best of friends anyhow. Uh, Councillor Loco, you've got a question? Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Richard, for, for your time and your presentation. I have a specific question, uh, two questions, quick ones. Uh, I represent the Tyler South and Holybrook, and we're the ones who are just next to Reading. Uh, there's a particular development called Hawkswood, and there seems to be an issue there where the residents have complained that they seem to be paying two fees, one to the developer or one to somebody, and another one to Thames Water because Apparently, um, there's a pump there and Thames Water would not take it on. So I wonder why that is. And, and the second question is a very quick one. You talk about your 1.25 billion spend. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder how you would align that with the statement from your CEO that you are um, untreated waste discharge, uh, untreated waste into the water, into the waters is unacceptable. So this 1.25 billion, is that going to remove that problem? Or if not, how much more and over what timeline, if you can share that? Okay, right, Maybe. thank you. I'm conscious as an ex Thames Water employee, I need to be careful what I say. Um, the, the the development you've talked about and the pump, I'm afraid it's, it's news to me. It, it absolutely doesn't sound right to me any more than it does to you. If you could let me have details, I'll, I'll get onto that and we'll sort out and give you a proper explanation of what's going on and hopefully remove the, the worry from, from, from the residents. In terms of the 1.25 billion, that will make a significant dent in the number of discharges. So as I mentioned earlier, we've committed to a 50% reduction in the total duration of discharges in a year by 2030 and 80% in the sensitive catchments. But it is a fact that the, you know, we, 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 we have 100,000 miles of sewers, we have 360 sewage treatment works, and they were all designed to overflow to the environment when they reach capacity. And sorting that out is going to take a lot more than 1.25 billion, and it's going to take a long time. But we are on the case. I mean, there, there were already things in the business plan. Um, you won't want me in this location to tell you about the Thames Tideway Tunnel, um, but it's making a huge difference to the CSO discharges in, in London. We've got big expansions. I've talked about Newbury Sewage Works being expanded. We're also expanding um, Oxford, Whitney, Fairford, and lots of others across the area. So the number of discharges and frequency will go down, but it's going to take a long time. No, there's no way of sugarcoating that, I'm afraid. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bennyworth, Dennis. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Aylard, uh, in your presentation, you identified four sewage treatment uh, works that are looking as though they're uh, running close to capacity. And uh, yeah. we scheduled for an upgrade, two of which were in, in my ward of Hungerford and Kimbury. Is there any idea as to how close to capacity these treatment works are? And could you possibly yeah. explain yeah. a little more of the, the go to green? Yeah, it's not so much capacity, it's more about the quality of the effluent. So we the, the sewage works has to achieve a standard consistently of the of the effluent so uh, uh, it might be five milligrams per liter for phosphorus it might be uh three for ammonia it might be 10 for suspended solids and that is monitored uh by us and by the environment agency and if the sewage the person who's operating the sewage works if the limit is five 
he will have in his pocket on his mobile phone a constant readout of what each of his works is doing. And if it gets to two or two and a half, he starts, starts to worry um, because these things can climb quite, quite, quite quickly. So what we're trying to do is improve the quality of the treatment to, uh, to, to, to get, the, to get more, more headroom between what we're actually delivering and the permit. So Kintbury, for an example, because it's going to the Grand Union Canal, uh, it's a really sensitive site. It's a site I know quite well, and it's actually just having a new inlet works built at the moment. You've probably seen the vehicles uh, arriving there, and I'll be happy to take you around to, to show you. But it's um, one of the issues we have is that the, the more sewage you push through the works, the less treatment it gets, and therefore the more likely you are to lose out on your quality parameters. It's a quantity versus quality. If you could constrain the amount coming in, you've got, you, you, you'll treat it to a higher standard. So if you want to put more flow through, we've also got to improve the treatment capacity, otherwise those levels will creep up. And that's where go, where go to Green comes in. It's sort of us getting ahead of the regulatory process to give ourselves a bit more resilience. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Lyndon, who's the, the last of the, the first time questions, and then we'll go back around for a couple more. I'm very conscious of time. I'd like to wrap it up in the next 10 minutes if I can. Councillor Lyndon. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Just a couple of uh, observations. Um, questions or observations? Well, I've got two, my two questions, but my observations will be very quick, Chairman. Yeah, I mean, um, I have noticed uh, over the years certainly smelling sewage in town centres in Newbury has actually dropped quite considerably. Uh, I did notice it uh, last Sunday when I went to the services, Burfield to London. Um, but my questions are really uh, the sewage discharge at Stratford Mortimer Sewage Works, which was sent to us uh, uh, after the agenda. So I've got a couple of points to ask you. Uh, firstly, uh, the duration of hours and the counting method may be, if there's a small gap, that can be explained because I know somebody did make a comment about that. And I did notice that some were pretty high. I noticed Reading, because I'm in Tarlhurst Birch Cops, which covers uh, Sainsbury's in Calcutt and Northwards. Um, and that was 267, so that's much lower. Uh, but um, also there were points about some of the stuff coming from uh, Mortimer uh, and uh, Burfield, which goes in towards London. But on page uh, six, um, on the third paragraph, uh, there have been instances at uh, Reading Sewage Works where suspected pollution has been investigated there have either been a crash prize as category three or no pollution or requiring little mitigation, otherwise category four. And the figures we've got uh, previously are on uh, the amounts on page uh, four in the top 10 sewage treatment works and the top 12. Does that really affect the diagnosis as such uh, in regards to... Uh, whether they're category or three or four. I just wanted a general point well, on that, please. There is a difference between a pollution incident, which is an, an acute, uh, something acute that's happened, and it's happened because something's gone wrong. Um, it, 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 it might be human error. Um, more often it's equipment failure, it can be power failure, and that has caused something that's happened in the course of an average day. And those incidents are categorised uh, by us and the Environment Agency from Category 1, which is a disaster, down to Category 4, which is no impact at all. So if there have been pollution incidents, they will have been investigated uh, and they will have been categorised. That's different to a, a, a discharge from the works, which is, where it's happened, which is where it's working as it's supposed to work. So it may be unacceptable, we may not like it, we may want to stop it, but it's happening as it's supposed to, and that wouldn't be a pollution incident unless very unusually um, it caused a fish kill or an environmental impact. By and large, those discharges happen when it's been raining. The storm tanks hold the flow back while the level in the river comes up, and there's a good degree of dilution. But I'm happy to look at each one of those incidents uh, with you separately if you'd like me to. Thank you, Jim. 
Thank you. Uh, so I've got Councillor Masters, Councillor Abs, and uh, I've got John Wynn Stanley, Service Director. And those are the last. Can I just restrict you all to just one other point question? Councillor Masters. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Richard, thank you. Um, I was made aware of a um, potential um, incident on the Northbrook stream adjacent to the A4 in the last week or so. Right. Do you have any information about that? And if not, could you follow up and see whether there was what? what I, certain, I certainly it was would, yes. high to It was a high turbidity. It was um, lots of cloudy, um, chalk-like right. discharge. Okay. Um, and I know a number of residents have been trying to follow up on it and have not had yeah. um, a satisfactory um okay well I, I don't know about that one i'm happy to look at it i mean yeah. what we do if anybody calls in to report a pollution first of all they get fast tracks through our customer center and then we get someone out to investigate uh within two hours day and night 24 7 so at any time of the day or night if you ring it ring up and you say i've seen what i think is a pollution we will have a crew there not just to look at it but a crew with kit in the back of the van to deal with the problem so can so, i can i communicate with you offline i mean no, please on, yeah, i'm happy to look at it but yeah. all i'm saying is in general yeah. if people see a pollution please call it in because too often i get oh it was about it was about three weeks ago and i think it was on a tuesday and i saw this and you know we can't we can't do with that but if people tell us straight away we got a, a chance of finding out what it is and fixing it on the spot i'm pretty sure that it was reported but, okay well then we'll, we'll, we'll find out I'll chat with you later yeah yeah absolutely thank you Councillor Abbs. Yeah, thanks very much. A couple of things are in the closing question is, is really do with sending information, really. I'd love to see if you wouldn't mind sharing your actual carbon net zero plan as a company. Yeah, absolutely. If yes. you could send that across, yes. that'd yes. be great. Yes. Um, I'm the nutrient neutrality, nutrient neutrality yes. it'll come out in a minute. Yeah. Nutrient neutrality uh, legislation mm. is something that's mm. important to me, but um, maybe you can comment on that. But really, I would like to understand about the uh, what you do directly after an incident. We've mm -hmm. killed some fishes, we've killed this, that, and the other. Yeah. What are you doing to help the recovery of the river? What contribution you make? I know that potentially you get yeah. fined and so on, yeah. but what, what are the, how do people get something from you to help? Right. If there's been a significant impact, which is usually uh, a major fish kill, then we know we're going to get prosecuted. It will take typically five to six years to get to court, during which absolutely nothing is done to help the river unless we choose to do it. And when we do get to court and are fined, the money goes to the treasury. Uh, nothing goes to the river at all. So what we started to do after a big incident in 2007 was what the courts now call voluntary reparation. So we will go down and we will meet the people concerned, typically a fishing club, but often it's a swimming group or whoever has lost out on amenity. And we'll discuss with them what their financial losses are and what we can do to put things right. Now, quite often it's been a big fish kill um, there's not an awful lot you can do. Um, you can restock uh, once, once the water quality is back, but mainly to get the invertebrate life back, you just need fresh water, uh, sunshine and fresh air, none of which you can buy. So what we will um, say, so for instance, we had a big incident on the River Ray um, near Swindon. I'm going down a week after next to meet the two local angling clubs and we'll be putting a significant amount of money on the table for restocking, for habitat improvements, uh, for um, recompensing them for loss of membership income, uh, for renting alternative waters. So we do whatever we can to put it right, bearing in mind there's been a disaster and there's, there's, there's no easy answers. But we do, we're the only company that does this, we do have a policy of voluntary reparation. I'm only smiling because you must be an awfully busy man. To be honest, we don't, I mean, touching lots of wood, we, we don't have very many incidents that result in major fish kills. Okay, so um, I'm sure I can get your contact details. So just FYI, I'm the shadow portfolio for the environment for Lib Dems. So I got right. to say that at the beginning. Yep. Right, of course. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the last uh, the last question or comment is taking us right back to the beginning, because if you remember right at the beginning, uh, we talked a little bit about flood alleviation. Yes. And I think it was Councillor Otto Walker, Walter uh, mentioned the, the Thatcham issue. Uh, and you said you'd like to have some more information. Uh, well, I think uh, John Wynne Stanley, who's the service director, uh, will probably be able to give you that and maybe make a few further comments. John, would you like to either come? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Richard, yeah, th this, this particular um, sort of specific scheme was the uh, Thatcham Memorial Fields uh, 
project that we're looking at and it is the last of a uh, you know, a long line of, uh, of projects that we're, we're looking to deliver our own thatch and we delivered quite a lot. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, you, you described, um, uh, uh, you described this, this scheme to a T uh, perfectly as, a, as a, an exemplar of uh, a flood alleviation. You have a sustainable drainage which holds the water back and mm -hmm. uh, relieves um, pressure on the Thames water, surface water sewer. Um, we, our, us and our consultants have worked very closely with yourselves on this particular project to make sure that, that the scheme was in line with your criteria. Um, and of course, it was a very modest sum that we were bidding for. Um, and when we were rejected, it was, it was particularly hard to take because, of course, it might just be a modest sum that we're looking for partnership funding for. But the way that environment agency funding works, it has a huge Im implication on the multiplier and and, and you know it has a, an implication on delivery of the scheme so it, it was it was quite tough to take given that it was we'd worked closely with yourselves it was a very good scheme and yeah that it was just to put a bit of specifics around that and and i'm very much welcome if we could uh, review it and, and perhaps look at the criteria again yeah i'm not close to that one john I and mean, i know in general terms obviously about about the problems i know i know we've been we've been working together i hadn't realized that you've been rejected but i will find out uh, what what happened and we'll we'll see if we can't reopen the discussion in some way at least thank you well look i'd like to uh, just uh, wrap this up uh richard i nikki i really appreciate you you coming i think you've You've given a very professional performance this evening, both in your presentation and your ability to uh, to answer to many of the questions. Uh, I'll echo uh, uh, Councillor Arms. You, you must be a very busy man. Uh, we've noted a number of actions, so I think you're yeah. going to get a number of uh, yeah. particular specific questions. I've also noted a couple of things you've advised us on, and, and uh, like... Uh, planning, for example, in the local plan, how mm -hmm. we can maybe manage and reduce water. We'll look into that. And anything you can yep. send back to us, uh, 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 guiding us on that would be very helpful. And uh, I, I hear you on lobbying for Section 3. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I think we should also take all that on board. So again, I'd like to, on behalf of uh, the Commission and on behalf of the members who attend, I'd like to thank both of you very much indeed. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for your very good questions. And we will do our best to follow up uh, as quickly as we can. Thank you. Appreciate it. OK. OK, members. Uh, next on the item on the agenda is the corporate parenting. Now, we, uh, we originally, I think, were looking at this from the point of view of uh, uh, fostering an adoption. Uh, but then we discovered that uh, the auditing department was looking at this as well. And so uh, it was subsequently suggested that OSMC should look at the, uh, the corporate parenting panel and how the council's approach to corporate parenting could be made more effective. So I'd like to invite uh, uh, Peter Campbell uh, to present the item. So, Peter, over to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair, uh, for this. As you as you rightly mentioned, it was uh, it, it's been an item that was originally looking specifically at fostering adoption, and then moved more to the what we'll call the bigger picture of corporate parenting. And just for people's uh, benefit, I'm sure you've read the paper actually there, but it's uh, corporate parenting. All those children who are not able to live with their family. Uh, or their immediate birth family and are uh, in our care. So they're our responsibility. And that's from age uh, a few days old, sometimes right up to the 18th birthday. And uh, we've got about 175 children that West Berkshire, we're corporate parent too. And almost as many again as care leavers, where we have a duty of care up to about age 25 as they progress into uh, full independence and adult life. So that's the corporate parenting. Now, when, when Councillor Boick, Dominic Boick, who chairs, the, who's a portfolio holder, of course, and chairs the corporate parenting panel, um, when, when he was having thoughts about bringing this to the, this committee, um, it was before our Ofsted inspection, which took place just earlier this year in March. And part of the Ofsted inspection looks at the, the health of corporate parenting and the buy-in the support, the understanding, the grip, if you like. Uh, and Ofsted gave West Berkshire a clean bill of health, um, noted it actually and commended uh, a lot of the ambition that we have for children that are in our care. And measures would be things like educational achievement and health and how many progress into good housing uh, and manage to uh, go off to a higher education, such as university. So it's got a clean bill of health. And so 
in some ways there was not much point either in asking this committee to uh, check whether we had a clean bill of health because it was uh, thoroughly done by Ofsted in their inspection in March. So move the goalpost just a little bit further to actually present to you the, this duty we have of corporate parenting both members and officers and and whether or, or attesting the environment if you like for us to become perhaps a little bit more ambitious i know uh, probably all the all the members uh, were introduced to corporate parenting at the start of the uh, of the administrative year uh, back in uh, 2019 and uh, there's also been some training in between but we don't update you on a regular basis which perhaps gives you opportunity to buy in as a as a whole council the corporate parenting panel as it has selected people who are uh, highly informed about the things they wish to see and the things they wish to follow and challenge but the wider council which like i say includes both officers and all the members uh, i think there might be that opportunity for us to better communicate some of the achievements some of the ambitions that we would like to do and um, try and maybe uh, notice what's going on really well in other areas and um, we won't be able to copy all of those things because some other areas will have maybe as many as a thousand uh, hampshire have got over 1500 children in care purely based on their size um, so they'll be able to certainly achieve things or have systems and processes in place that just wouldn't be practical for us uh, but nevertheless there'll be good ideas we can copy from other areas uh, we're keen that more children communicate back to us about the impact of the services that they're relying on and finding creative ways to do that including social media and the technology as as well as meeting up with them face to face which councillor Bowick and myself do as well as some other uh, councillor Pattenden's done as the shadow uh, portfolio holder for the children so that's that's it the other thing that I've put as some of the recommendations it's actually at 5.18 is uh, the the ideas of uh uh, being aware of some of the major things that we're fairly confident are going to come down the line uh, of around corporate parenting that includes Ofsted increasing and um, certainly some of their focus on care leavers that's young people generally speaking that have got to the age 18 and uh, also the social care review that was done by a guy called Josh McAllister the government is has has committed to respond to the recommendations from that review uh, before Christmas so um those that's that's corporate parenting in a nutshell really and I just just take the moment to say certainly from a number of the members that are here tonight and uh, I bump into in other settings uh, often show a huge interest in the young people of West Berkshire that we're corporate parents into and I'd, I'd like to thank you for that uh, certainly I get a lot of individual comments and interest expressed and I guess this report is probably looking at what we can do that is perhaps has a, a bit of a wider scoop and helps people to feel as in a bit more informed than perhaps they are. It takes a little bit of the mystery away from corporate parenting and uh, and also celebrate some of the huge achievements and things that managed to happen. So so that's it in a nutshell. Very happy to answer any questions or, or um, take any ideas away from anyone who wishes to raise anything. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pete. Does uh, Councillor Boyk wish to add to anything? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Pete, for your uh, presenting this paper. Uh, I just really want to uh, back up what Pete's been saying there. Uh, we, we know that uh, we, we do a great job of uh, parent, uh, corporate, corporately parenting our children in care. And my ambition, though, is that we do an even better job of that. And I think somewhat, uh, to, 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 to some extent, um, the corporate parenting uh, is kind of uh, um, not restricted, but but bound by the formal structures of parenting panel and so on. And I'd like to see members being much more involved. I don't mean coming along to the panel, but I I, I need I mean uh, members being aware of uh, more aware of their responsibilities and acting upon them whenever they have the opportunity. I'm really interested in hearing from the, from the commission um, uh, uh, questions that you might have and ideas so thank you chairman yeah thank you uh I, i'm going to as one of my fellow chairman always makes a point so i'm going to claim chairman's privilege to to go first here um very good report uh, everything seems to be uh, 
all in order. Uh, but uh, and I, I, I note and uh, welcome the ambition to take it even further. Uh, some of the examples were given, for example, uh, we, we'd like to maybe produce an annual report to full council. Uh, we maybe want to put something up on the website about it. My question is, what's stopping you? Why not? That's the first question. I don't know whether uh, Dominic or Pete, will, 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 which of you wish to answer that. And the other thing is, uh, I, I was uh, somewhat shocked to see that the Scottish government seemed to have done something reasonable. Um, the, uh, you know, <laughs> naming a number of bodies and uh, going into community parenting. So my real question is, what do we have to do? Can we do that on our own? Or is that something we've got to encourage the government to do for, to help us do? Those are my two questions. Mm. Um, really good question. I think I would lean towards your, your second question first. Um, the community parenting, I think, is a thing that is is something we can certainly uh, promote, encourage, enable. Uh, no doubt about that. And and actually, the the our, our relationships with the local police and some of those examples that are there in the Scottish what the Scottish government have put in the legislation, uh, our relationships with the schools and and certainly a number of the community groups like Berkshire Youth. Uh, and groups like that actually, I would say, are, are very supportive. There's another way of describing it, actually. I think, I think we'll see copycat legislation, I think, coming, coming into England. I do. And uh, seeing that uh, collective responsibility, for want of another word, I think, I think it will become community parenting. Going back to your other one, yeah, it probably sounds like uh, I, I, I regret if it comes over as I'm waiting for permission to do an annual report. And um, we, we did an annual, uh, we we did an annual celebration event, which a number of uh, members come to, and I know uh, certainly Councillor Doxy supported it for years, Councillor Burke as well, and a number of others. And and COVID affected that. That was that was a, an event that uh, particularly celebrated uh, educational achievement with young people, but also work experience, all sorts of others, anything we could find actually. Uh, and uh, and what uh, an arrangement, a celebration is arranged this year. Uh, that will be our uh, that we can build or in effect it becomes an annual report in in living form uh, that's actually been booked in again for October so we're hopeful that after two years of it being too disrupted to actually happen we can start that again and what we're thinking of is autumn a, a live event where young people and their carers about 75 percent of those children i've said 175 about 75 percent of them live in a foster care setting and they'll come with their foster carers to that event and uh I would suggest, or our plan would be, maybe six months after that in the spring, that's when we'd coincide with an annual report, which will be some of both the achievements and the ambitions. So we, we can we can do that. I think it would be, we missed an opportunity there. The, the corporate parenting panel get reports galore, but actually thinking about making it just wider and to some extent, maybe a little bit uh, less jargon and more, more, more accessible uh, for, for a wider group. Um, that's certainly an action we can take. Yeah, I think we just need a summary of that to go to full council, maybe at the, uh, the council annual meeting. Yeah, okay. Uh, Councillor Vickers. Chairman, yeah, I, I, uh, I really haven't got much to add to what you and, and others have said. I'm, over the years that I've been a councillor, some of the most memorable meetings in this room have been with the young people um, talking about their experiences working with this council, our officers in particular, uh, to improve their lives, to make the best of their lives. That seems to have dropped out of my diary. It may be COVID, but I, I have a feeling that uh, although the, the outcomes are good and got nothing to worry about, I do feel that members need to be more engaged. Um, we, we don't get the minutes. We don't, I mean, often um, it's only when my wife gets because she's on the corporate panel and has a professional, long-term professional interest in this sort of thing. It's only because she gets the minutes that I even know the meetings are on. And often it turns out it was something I'd quite like to have come along to, but I sort of don't feel at the moment as though the rest of us members are kind of welcomed. It's sort of a, a little clique almost, and it shouldn't be. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Linden. Thank you, Chair, and I share many ideas from Councillor Vickers uh, on that. I was on the panel quite some time ago, and I'm really pleased 
that it's still doing very positive work. Um, I think um, it's going to be very useful, certainly from next May, for the new councillors, because I think there's going to be quite a big change because uh, of people retiring. Um, but um, they especially need to know what is going on. And in terms of members' training as well, as I know we call them developments, to member development, being quaint about it. But I, I, I possibly one way of doing things, and I've been arguing this on several points, I mean, it's very useful that we do get the Chief Constable's annual report pre-council. Maybe we can do something fairly brief on this and certainly other issues, which, frankly, members, if they're not going to be need to be aware of uh, and it, it keeps them understanding their duties not just being corporate parents but other other areas of the council and I think it is very useful indeed uh, to doing so and uh, I noticed in the past <coughs> we've covered diverse things uh, something totally different from that in terms of uh, waste to energy products uh, programs and going to visits and finding out that uh, discharges are, are quite professionally dealt with and that would be certainly useful on the last eastern area planning but I, I just think we need to be aware when we're looking at things post may that maybe we need to include members having some additional information thank you Jim. okay thank you tom councillor masters thank you chairman um i echo many of the sentiments and commend um, Pete for, for the report um, and just like to say that um, I thoroughly um, I found his briefings and, and um, you know certainly at the beginning of this administration um, when we could meet in person and, and hear about what him and his team have been doing I'm extremely um, impressed by that and I understand that Pete's um, moving on to pastures new so I I think um, I'd like to thank him for his sterling effort, and I think his successor is going to, um, you know, have to hit the ground running to uh, match that. So, I, um, thank you very much, Pete. I think we'll all echo that. Uh, Councillor Cole, thank you, Chairman. Um, good report. Very interesting. Some comments going through it. Um, there's a mention of low profile. Seven years ago, I'd have said no profile. So. It really must change. Um, I love the idea of name change to community par parenting, if we can do that. Comment about most local authorities have a corporate parenting board that meets in public, but West Parks does not. What's the downside? I saw a comment in there about potential for having a policy of no housing evictions for care leavers. If you compare that to the basic premise of would this be good enough for my child, I'm afraid that doesn't work for me. Um, I have to be limits somewhere. But my last comment is why not have a care lever, perhaps someone who left care five, ten years ago, on the panel? We do. Yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. Um, we, we do, and we, we've had a few represent that uh, Councillor Bowick's met. In fact, I think Councillor Bowick found one of them an employment opportunity, uh, which which was fantastic. But um, yeah, we've we've had that. What you what what has become the phrase care experienced? I still use the word care lever. A uh, care experienced uh, young people feeding into the panel, and also uh, developing um, them them becoming care champions. Uh, in five point two two, we've mentioned about uh, someone the government. National advisor for care leavers. He's actually coming to West Berkshire in October, and he's going to um, give us some ideas that would be appropriate to our and challenge, but appropriate to one of our size and uh, an area of our size. And his particular strength is engaging with the care leavers and care experienced young people and coming up with ideas there. So thank you for that suggestion. Uh, we we do do it. We can always we can always try and do it better the way we engage uh, young people. I think I think we'd probably say that the corporate parenting panel has has been quite focused on scrutiny over the years. That arguably that was wholly appropriate, uh, particularly when we were uh, Ofsted had concerns about our performance. 
so it was right and proper and and we never want to lose the scrutiny the challenge and scrutiny which that panel does but i think we've perhaps missed an opportunity more for celebration and wider uh, promotion of, of many of the good things that go on. And uh, it's really pleasing to hear tonight, actually, that would be that would be sort of welcomed with open arms if it was perhaps just done a bit more formally, other than when uh, individual people bump into me or ask me particular things, uh, that would be good. The McAllister Review mentions a I can't remember for the life of me which one it was. It was somewhere like Derby Count, Derby City Council. There was a there was there's a local authority that brought in a policy of we're not going to evict a care experienced young person, and the McAllister Review picks it up as something uh, to to put it out there really and see um, getting that, getting and there as you've perhaps evidence counts the cold that there'd be, be a different view about what would be the best thing for my child uh, as as they go you know as they take responsibility and move into adulthood um but that's 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 um th those those things are uh, that's where that comes from uh, some of those ideas actually in the community parenting okay you did mention one other thing that slipped my mind was there something else you mentioned just before you mentioned about eviction i think no you can't remember either it's not important <laughs> Meeting in public. Oh, meeting in public. Um, to be, uh, uh, yes, it, it, some some corporate parenting uh, panels will do a meeting. The only comment that would come to my head is in a in a fairly small local authority, you do increase the possibility where particular young people can be identified which would make me just a bit cautious. Um, some, some young people are in care because they have particular support needs, some children with acute disabilities that would require 24-hour care. Um, and thankfully, numerically, there's not many, but, and we have quite a number of asylum seekers there in care because there's a, what we call absent parenting. We have all sorts of uh, reasons for people who are coming into care, but in a, in a relatively small authority, uh, there is, there is a, 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 in our corporate parenting, we look at how far away some young children are and, um, and where, where they're living, where they're based, and indeed the type of care package they've got. And there's just the risk. And that would probably, that would probably be my hesitation if we ever moved to a public one, how would we ensure we, didn't, we don't inadvertently um, um, cause someone's information to be shared when it when it shouldn't be. Okay, I get that. Pete, thank you very much indeed. Uh, good report and uh, good so some good suggestions. And why don't you just get on with doing your yep. report and get the website up and working on a few of the other things? We should do that. Thanks for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Dominic. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, and I, I just like to thank members for their interest in this uh, in Pete's report and, and for your suggestions. Uh, but I'd, I'd just remind um, uh, or make the point that um, uh, co corporate parenting is more is about more than an annual report. Uh, um, I think it's a great idea. I, 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 I'm encouraging uh, Pete to go ahead with that suggestion that we produce an annual report for council. But co corporate parenting goes on the year round, and it goes on locally, not just in the in a chamber or in a, a formal meet, meeting setting. So please, members, um, do everything you can to support our children in care. I think we all got that, don't we? I think the, the, the point about the report was there was a need for a little bit better communication. That was all. Okay. Good. Uh, I would now like to skip items eight and nine and see, hopefully we can get back to them just later on. Uh, but I'd like to go to item 10, uh, because uh, this is the first time we're going to have the finance uh, presented to OSMC before it comes to executive. So uh, could I invite, please, Joseph Holmes to present, firstly, uh, item 10, the quarter one revenue report. Joseph. Okay, uh, good evening, Chairman. Thank you very much. And I'll just go through the highlights from the uh, report here at Overview and Scrutiny. Uh, item 10 on the revenue finance performance uh, side of things. And as you can see in here, the council at the moment is forecasting uh, an overspend of £2.1 million after mitigations, um, which is certainly a higher overspend than perhaps we have forecast previously at quarter one, uh, just uh, in line with uh, many other 
uh, councils and uh, businesses and individuals across the country were seeing the impact of uh, inflation on our budgets coming through, uh, especially, for example, in uh, items such as inflation uh, and as well as uh, on the yet to be finalised pay award as well. Uh, also seeing very significant pressures in the people director on demand coming through. Uh, that's especially so in adult social care and children's social care uh, in the areas you, you, you just discussed actually earlier on. Uh, and we are also seeing uh, some of the residual income pressures coming through from COVID-19 and the pandemic. So you can see a couple of items there specifically around car parking income and the leisure contract as well. The underlying position uh, on savings is quite positive. So this is certainly not a overspend which is driven by non-achievement of savings and that underlying financial management. Uh, there is some supporting information in here around some of the increased uh, demand that you see in here, for example, in adult social care. Uh, when we set the budget, the number of individuals in long-term services was just under 1,700, with that expected to be about 1,734 already at the start of the financial year. That was over 1,800 individuals in there. So that demand's gone up by uh, sort of between 5 and 6%, which on our major spend area um, is a really significant increase. Uh, you can see there, there's some mitigations uh, in here. Um, obviously, we'll bring back quarter two coming through as well to see what uh, changes uh, uh, can be put in place to help further mitigate this. That is. Okay. Questions, Councillor Masters. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Joseph. Just um, a couple of questions, really. Um, do you see the trend for the overspend uh, levelling out, increasing, decreasing over the next quarters, especially with the pressures on adult social care, for in mind? Um, and associated with that, um, is there anything coming down from central government to indicate that they are going to be offering support um, financially for local authorities? And you know, where is that being progressed if it's already in hand? Okay, uh, through you, Chairman. So, uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Master. So, on that, and adult, especially in adult social care, um, you know, we have the model there. That's what we base our sort of forecast on, what we see coming through. Now, if you look at the model, which is contained within the pack, you see over the last couple of years, like sort of month five, month six, the numbers start to come down. Now, clearly, if that happens, that will provide a much more positive position coming through into quarter two and quarter three. I'm reluctant to make that assumption at the moment because the last two years have been, um, you know, unprecedented in, 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 in what we face. So from what we can see in the model at the moment, that is where the, the forecast remains. Clearly, if the numbers do come down, then it, it will uh, absolutely be an improved position. In respect of government funding, um, we will have to see uh, what comes through from uh, uh, Department for Leveling Up uh, and Housing and Communities in the coming sort of days, weeks and months, if anything further is offered there. Uh, certainly, if you look at other uh, sort of similar unitary councils like ourselves, um, you can just see that there's a, a significant number of sort of publicly available uh, quarter one figures uh, with quite large overspends. Medway Council, for example, is 12 and a half million pounds. Wokingham about 2.3 million pounds. Wiltshire, 6 million pounds. Luton, 10 million. I can go on, but there is clearly a significant pressure uh, across the sector for, for very similar reasons, actually, that, that, that I've outlined here. Um, we may well see, you know, and we've certainly got more uh, funds that we do need to apply uh, from specific grants that we've had come in uh, during the year around, uh, uh, especially around the uh, um, Ukraine scheme, for example, as well. Some of that will assist where we need to apportion that, that out further. But again, we'll bring that through in, in quarter two. Okay, Councillor Cole. I'm sorry to get you come back. Thank you, Chairman. I've got three quick ones, if I may. Page nine, five, ten, third line. What does managing demand to the model entail? So where's that? Page then, nine. Page nine. You look at the top of top of page nine. There's a third line uh, on the right hand side. It says oh, managing, managing demand, demand to the, to the model. model. Yeah. What does okay. that mean? Do you want to do these one by one? Yeah, let's do it one by one. Is it okay, Chairman, if I answer that question on behalf of Joseph? Is that all right? 
um, in terms of the managing demand in, in the model. That's about trying to ensure that we keep people out of receipt of care for as long as possible by offering advice and guidance or um, supporting to access services non-statutory and not delivered by the local authority. Um, and also trying to make sure that we support people for as long as possible um, to access lower level services so they don't escalate into needing more care. So we can use things like reopenment to help with that um, and trying to make sure that people are only getting the level of care that they absolutely need at the right time. Understand. Thank you. Next question. Page 10, 517. What is, there's lower occupancy in our own care homes and clients have had to be placed in externally commissioned beds costing more cover. For example, we have space in no trees in Kimberley. I've had so. Yeah, in terms of the, um, the use of external beds, there's, there's a couple of different reasons for that. So one can be that um, the homes that we have internally can't cope with the complexity of the resident um, and therefore they have to go to a home that can, can manage that complexity in a different way. Um, or alternatively, there could be issues that mean it's not suitable for that person to go to that place at that time in one of our internal homes. So we have to use an external home. We could have, for example, issues around um, placement restrictions for certain types of care, et cetera, that mean we have to use an external placement. Okay, thank you. Page 15. Why is the forecast increase 20 clients in 2022, but the model only 10 in 2023? Um, so that will be down to the way in which the model is calculated. And we, we do that through a trend analysis of where um, client numbers have gone over the past few years. But we also use local intelligence around those clients that we know are already in the system. So um, for previous periods, we've had um, some support through government funding and then through our local health colleagues around discharge from hospital um, that have meant that some clients were being funded in certain, certain ways that were outside of our own funding streams. Um, we know those clients were coming into the model in this period, but they, those clients will then be in. We won't have other clients coming in that way in the future. So it's the way that we deal with the, the model, both in terms of a trend analysis, but then also overlaying our local intelligence on top of that. Hmm. It'd be interesting to see how that pans out. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I, I missed Councillor Linden and Sam was up first. Councillor, uh, thank you, Chairman. That's fine. Um, yes, um, to Joseph. Um, I've um, obviously we've got a limited amount of usable reserves, maybe that's going to be a particular problem at the moment over the next couple of years. But uh, inflation is likely to go up. Uh, also, <coughs> uh, bank rates and other things are going up. There is also the pay awards as well, which is uh, can court catch you out because government's recommendation on pay awards and certainly uh, the Royal Barch Fire and Rescue Service found out a couple of years ago that they listened to the government advice and then had to pay an awards, which I'm budgeted for. Um, but we got the five for fire, which helped out on that for that last year. The um, energy costs are going to be quite high. And I know uh, things like swimming pools and things need a lot of energy as well. And also, <coughs> I know some of our schools are going to be suffering with the amount of uh, uh, use uh, as well as the health service so all these things could really make things worse in relation to our uh, reserves so obviously I don't know what we're planning to do because we're going to wait and see what the government uh, provides in the budget just before Christmas but maybe uh, you could answer some of my uh, questions uh, more broadly thank they, you they were they were observations rather than questions but perhaps you could comment on his observations please i can thank you very much uh chairman and, and, and councillor linden so uh, just going through some of those so in respect to reserves our um minimum level of reserves that i set out in the budget paper was seven million pounds currently standard about 8.9 million pounds we've got about 1.9 uh, above that minimum capacity at the moment which you see if we ended up at, at an outturn at this level would actually push us slightly below 
that minimum uh, level. Uh, so we are certainly not awash uh, with reserves to help uh, support that uh, position, but, um, but, but we, we do have that minimum level uh, that I set uh, there. Respect to some of the other points raised, yes, bank rates. Um, one of the areas of underspend this year is where we are not borrowing uh, or a night borrow for the capital programme in the current year. So our cash balances uh, remain relatively healthy, certainly compared to uh, before the pandemic. Uh, so by not borrowing and not incurring some of those additional capital financing costs, and that's one of the areas uh, that we are um, being able to underspend and offset some of the larger overspends. And then in respect of inflation, um, inflation is only an issue in this year's budget and you know, specifically uh, Council Linden, you mentioned around the pay award, but also around a range of other budget budgets. If I just pick on inflate uh, on energy inflation, for example, our budget in the last financial year was just over a, uh, three quarters of a million pounds uh, expected uh, spend of about 1.7 million pounds this year. So you can see that's more than double last year's budget. We did set aside some additional funding for uh, inflation, which we expected in respect of energy when the council set the budget in March. As you see, energy prices have continued uh, to rise. And similarly, in respect of adult social care, again, we did uh, set aside some additional inflation funding into adult social care. So though we are seeing it's any increased demand pressure there, most of the inflationary costs have been covered off. Um, and then our other big area of inflation is around the waste contract. And again, when we set the, 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 the budget of all council in March, we had fully provided for that inflation, where we certainly see a much larger pressure on inflation is into 2023-24, when you see the full year impact of some of those inflationary numbers around things like home to school transport uh, and anything that does have fuel energy related, uh, that will be uh, quite significant. Okay, uh, just if I may, just uh, before I get to Councillor Alves and Councillor Vickers, I had a question that's just directly related to that. On your page five, you've got your revised forecast. So your forecast is given all these variables this is what your best i won't use the guess but it's your best planned outcome have you changed your assumptions on inflation to get that number and if so what are they yeah so some of those inflationary impacts weren't necessarily been here at quarter one because the, the, at the time inflation perhaps wasn't sure. running at, at, at that level so i'd expect actually there to be some additional inflationary pressure certainly around energy coming into quarter into quarter two so that there, there still will be more of an impact i think coming through there chairman so but my question was so that this two one three two one three six is your forecast for year end yes given what we well, a lot of these unknowns but you must have never made a change of assumption on inflation what from when we set the budget yes from when you set the budget to get this forecast I'm not asking you to get your budget. I'm asking what you, you must have done something to get this forecast. Yes, absolutely, Chairman. So, yeah, within that, people have, have made an assessment of what they think that extra inflation okay. will be. And that's coming yeah, it's in the first. That's, that's what that was, Mike. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah. I, maybe, maybe I didn't make myself very clear to start with. Okay, fine. Uh, Councillor Rams. Funnily enough, Chairman, it's um, pretty much along the same theme. <laughs> I can't, can't really avoid the uh, energy inflation. Limit. And I'm, I'm just trying to get it crystal clear in my head because we are looking backwards and I guess when you put the report together, it wasn't great, but um, it, it's not as bad as what we now know, because we already now know that, unless uh, our new uh, PM does something on Thursday, that we can all go few. Um, for example, my energy costs at my data centres, they're trying to put a 550% increase in, in the charge. But that's not anything reflecting. So if you get anything like that here, you 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 know that's going to you know we've got some sear and I think inflation is well depends which particular worry you look at it could be as high as eighteen percent twenty percent not ten percent so I, I mean we're getting to a point I feel that you know from a scrutiny perspective we're getting to a point where we we kind of need to get a, a closer view and a closer estimate given what what we, we know is coming or I think at least what we think no is coming because the war could end and it all could all drop back down again but. Um, can can we do that? Can we can we get closer to what you know we really understand is going to come as it well, what we think is going to come rather than looking so far back? Yeah, so I think um so, uh, so thank you, Chairman uh, Councillor Harris. I think um you'll certainly see more of that a quarter two when we will have uh, you know, a, a revised update in there. We can put a spe specific element, a specific 
a uh, few paragraphs in there around inflation and, and particularly around energy inflation. We have those numbers. One well, of my concern is can Q, Q2 is still not going to reflect where we're going to be by the end of the fiscal year, which is... Well, that, yeah. Maybe I'm missing something. Well, this no, is, no, I think yeah. by Q2, though, given that we've seen the numbers around predictions around 18%, some of those, some of those uh, increased forecasts will be coming through. Um, I think the other thing to highlight is what was well, uh, which again has helped us offset some of those energy inflation costs, um, uh, including with this forecast, is where we have, as part of the time or two program, reduced our office uh, footprint because if we had all of our offices open... I just like you're now, reading my mind because that's the um, next place I was going. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, um, uh, you know, if, if, if we had those, then we would have seen actually from a, from a corporate energy point of view, probably quite... Quite well, in, indeed, and, and but the flip side of that with Time Lord is fairly shortly all of those people with their boilers at home trying to stay warm during the winter will really see the impact of working from home and the current trend towards, yes, I'd like to, and we're all guessing, but uh, actually I'd like to return to the office because I can't afford to heat my home. What do we do? I mean, we've got some serious planning to do here for what could happen this winter, and, I, and that's going to directly affect, because we're closing offices, right? So... We've done all sorts of things because of one trend, and now we may rapidly go the other way. And that's a big fiscal impact on us. Yeah, not easy. Councillor Vickers. Yes, yeah, so my, my, I, I always struggle with the way that these reports are laid out. Now, I mean, I, I did do some maths, but I didn't do accounting, I have to admit. And I didn't do local government accounting, which is a different world from... <laughs> well, even different from the MOD, which in turn is different from private sector. But um, I don't understand how the figures on pages seven to nine of this supplementary uh, agenda sort of all tie together. I mean, just to take one example in my shadow portfolio area, which is on page nine, paragraph five, ten, under the mitigation proposals, there's an item, development control, 100,000. Now, I'd like to dig into the detail with the service manager as to what exactly is going on there, but just to take that figure, and, the, and it's part of a total of 214,000, where does that fit in other tables? I just don't see what the table is. It's not particularly user-friendly to us as lay members. And... I don't know whether some change so, in formatting can it's be... Under the it's under the mitigation column on the, the table below that. The 214 for it that you're referring to is in there under mitigation. So it's part of their forecast. Right. I mean, I must admit, I, I, I was expecting to... I've done most of my pr preparation for this meeting under the, the drainage, the, the, the flood at risk management. I, I only come to this because our finance portfolio holder is okay. not here, and okay. I thought... I have a duty to try and understand this item, but I just don't find it terribly easy to lay out. But on that specific item, I don't know whether there's an officer that can answer the question that we're talking about an area which a lot of us members who are on planning committees are, are concerned about. We know that there's a, a great leakage of, of trained planning officers and a difficulty in recruiting and we're relying on agency. Are we saying that despite that, we're proposing to make a saving of a further 100,000 on what was budgeted? Because I, I really wonder why, whether, whether that's the right priority. I know planning Joseph, only you, affects people who are applicants. Yeah. Judge, the good good, good question. Joseph, do you want to answer this? Uh, uh, yes, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Councillor Vickers. Um, actually, I see uh, er Eric Owen says his hand up. But um, what we're proposing to do there is, is not make an additional saving, but to restrict some of the agency costs that we do have. Uh, in place uh, to bring them back down in line with what the what 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 the budgeted staffing costs. Does that been. mean that planning is not is not going to fill gaps in planning posts with um, agency staff brought in, which means that the workload is going to build up and there are further backlogs in you know processing planning applications, which in turns has a knock on on the economy, doesn't it? If you're not processing planning applications, then developments aren't going ahead and houses aren't being built. So I just do query the prioritization of that as a saving or a, Can as I, a measure. Joe, so let me get you off the, the, yep. the, the hook a little bit here because I've seen uh, Sue Helliwell's got her hand up. Uh, I know Councillor McKinnon wants to come and address it as well. So if I can 
Sue, is it, did you put your hand up directly related to the points and the questions that uh, Councillor Vicker has been making? Yes, and, and really to provide some, some assurance um, around um, the, the planning service, uh, the team, the number of FTE we have, and, and that um, there is no intention to um, uh, allow for any kind of backlog. As you say, the planning process um, is there to support the economy. Um, and what we're looking to do is to improve the efficiency of the planning service, to improve the amount of income that we generate through the planning service. Um, and that can be fed back into improvements within the planning processes so that we can make sure that we speed up the process so that we can support the growth of the economy. That's very helpful, Chairman. I mean, I, I'm, I'm overdue a meeting with um, Erica um, as service director and generally need to have a better understanding of the reorganisation of the service, okay. I think, to understand this. Can I ask uh, uh, Councillor McKinnon, do you want to make any comments rel relative to this point? Um, I put my hands up uh, before Councillor Vickers made his point. I was sort of waiting until the end, but okay. if, if, if others want to go first, then you come okay. back. Okay, I'll, I'll keep, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up on that. Uh, Councillor Rams. Yeah, it's just a really small one there, Chairman. Um, main report, pages 107 to 120. Can I please, please ask that someone reformats <laughs> this page? Um, why on earth we've got equal size columns? I don't know. It makes no sense. Um, okay. Title and purpose could be expanded. Change the font sizes on things if you want, but blimey, we've got about 10 pages we just don't need there. Okay. And I know it's a minor thing, but it makes for scrolling and hard work consuming it. So. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, okay, uh, before I get Councillor McKenna, can I, uh, as chairman, I've got a four, three or four, perhaps even five questions, points that I'd like, and I'm probably giving you a heads up for questions that probably will come with executive. Uh, the first one I have is when we get to, uh, You've already answered the one about the inflation assumption, so you may very well do that again. But then over the page, and on 4.4, .4, uh, on top of page six, we're talking a lot about, um, we've just been mentioning it in planning, the remaining overspend, and this is in adult social care, cross staffing budgets due to agency cover. And that's the only reference I've got. I cannot find anywhere, because my immediate was how much? What are we talking about here? You've mentioned it's an overspend. How much is agency cover? How much is agency cost coming? I, you, know, you, you can answer me now if you know it, right off the top, but if you don't, I think you should be prepared to do that. I think we have to have a good old look at, uh, at your agency because it's coming up all in other places. Do, do you want to address that or first? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, for that. You can see that actually just in the paragraph below, there's another reference to extra costs in children and families, for example, the £1.1 yep. million pounds on agency. Our personnel committee have been looking at agency uh, costs and, and they have certainly increased. So the total amount of agency spend has been going through to, to, to personnel uh, committee. I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer. I don't want to give you the wrong answer, though, uh, but it is there in the personnel. Well, if I, was, uh, if I was an executive, I'd be asking, what are your total agency costs? Yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think you and I have a bit of deja vu on that question, haven't we? So I'm just going back to one more, more yep. at the point that, uh, Chairman. I mean, one thing we have uh, set up is uh, a recruitment and agency uh, panel uh, uh, chair, chaired by the Chief Executive, uh, which is looking at all new uh, recruitment and all new agency uh, requests coming through uh, to provide additional uh, sort of scrutiny uh, and, and additional steps of sort of due diligence uh, around that uh, as well to sort of enhance our review, given, given that we know the staffing costs are quite a significant element of our overall yeah, budget. Yeah, uh, th th thank you. Uh, and I'll just restrict myself to one other point, and it's really not so much the finance, it's the basis of it. So it's the adult social care. So if, uh, if Mr. Sharp is still around. On page 12, where we have the adult social care annualized client numbers for long-term services. I was, we have a big query. How come at the end of the year, say at the end of... Uh, uh, 21, 2021 going into 21-22, we suddenly find over the course of two months, the number of clients go up by 70. Big jump. Why is the jump at that time of the year? Similarly, at the end of that year, 
uh, going into the current year, we've had a major jump of 113. So when we plan the budget, uh, and then we're now reporting on the budget, we, we, we're surprised that there's a jump of 113. Uh, what's going on here? Is this just, is this poor forecasting, poor budgeting, or is there something, what's the explanation for those jumps? Andy, do you want to, can you address that? If I may, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the way in which the, the, the modeling is constructed. So we have to close down the numbers um, and report them through to our finance colleagues, et cetera, to allow the budget bill to take place. So there's a gap in time um, that means that we don't calculate the figures and don't report those figures. So then you get a, a jump in the numbers, but they are profiled into the base budget. Um, so they're still being tracked within the service, but it's just how the, the build takes place. Um, there's another another reason more recently, um, which has been to do with COVID, which I referenced in one of my previous answers. So we've had clients that have been funded through different funding streams that were um, not clients of ours for longer periods of time and then they became clients of ours when the funding structures changed um, so that's part of the reason also for, the, for you seeing the jump in numbers okay. uh, if i can just comment are you saying that there's a jump in the numbers because you've got to freeze the time uh, in which the you're, you're putting your forecast numbers in to help a budget and that's probably frozen back when about january time february maybe even before that but you're saying the actual budget does take account of the latest figures is that what i heard that is indeed what you heard, Chairman. Yes, we, we profile what we think is going to happen, but there's a closed down period in which figures are, are used to calculate the budget going forward. Yeah, but but if in, say, January, February, March, you suddenly realise I've got an extra 70 odd people, you do try to get that into the budget as a pressure, yeah? Yes, because we're profiling the expectation of those clients that will come in during that period. So we don't always get it completely right, but it's profiled. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that was happening because... If I go back two and a half to three years, it wasn't happening that way. And uh, we, we spent a long time around that particular issue. So thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Councillor McKinnon, would you like to make your comment? Or? Yeah, thanks very much, Chairman. And um, yeah, big thanks to Joseph for presenting that report and answering uh, the questions from members. And thanks to members of the uh, committee for, for asking them. I just wanted to reiterate really that the, the drivers of the overspend, and, and Joseph mentioned this, earlier on, it's not a failure to achieve savings. You know, it's, it's not that the, the forecasting is poor. It's, 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 it's factors that are out with the council's control in, in line with many other local authorities. Um, I just wanted to make a, a, a couple of points, really, that the, the ASC model itself has been reviewed externally by an expert from the LGA, who's provided us with very positive feedback on the model. Um, not all local authorities do model numbers the way we do, uh, quite surprisingly. Um, so I know that some of my colleagues actually on the executive have, have, have made that statement that they'd like to get some external validation of the model. That has happened. And of course, no model is ever correct, as I'm sure you know you and, and, and other members are aware. Um, so, so no, I, I think that was a, a comp comprehensive report there from Joseph. Um, questions were very, very well answered. Um, and uh, thanks to all for your contribution. Well, we, we, you may have another question coming up. Thank you, Councillor Abs. Last one. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I, I, I was an old hand, but I did. I did have something that popped in. It was to do with that personnel committee. It was uh, the the overspend was uh, not the overspend. The amounts being spending an agency was is uh, at least a seven figure sum, and it was it was pretty high. We were alarmed because I'm on that committee uh, when we saw that number. But uh, just for for information, really, uh, one of the some postulation was done is this thing to the IR35 changes. You know, in other words, are we um, are we by going for agencies to recruit for us? Are we artificially raising rather than hiring you know people directly? And um, you know, I've seen that in the industry. I'm happy to kind of talk with people about it outside of this, but that that's what came up at the personal health committee to do with that. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's interesting. I always refer to the the numbers as a canary in the uh, in the coal mine. Uh, they're only the numbers. They're only the indicators. But what's going on beneath the surface is councillor. Vickers has talked about, and as, as I was exploring with the, the adult social care numbers, is what really matters. Uh, okay, fine. Thank you very much. Uh, can we now go on to item 11, agenda item 11, which is the uh, capital financial report? I think that's you again, isn't it? Uh, or is it, uh, or, or is it, is it Sh Shannon? Uh, no, it's me again. It's you. Uh, Jim, okay, so, fine. No, I'm, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
slightly shorter report, uh, this one, um, but you can see that we've got a forecast um, uh, there, a, a bit of an underspend, uh, and you see there's some reprofiling to uh, happen to go into future financial years as well. Um, as you as sort of reference back as part of the revenue uh, budget, though we expect to deliver a significant amount of the capital program, it does face a number of issues uh, uh, around certainly rising costs. And, and again, I think in, in the longer term, it will be on the capital program where we will perhaps see the largest, um, certainly of uh, 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 cost-wise in absolute uh, terms, pressure coming through for inflation, certainly on, on a range of our, our, our projects and construction ones in education, as well as in highways and transport, we are seeing quite significant inflationary rises across a range of materials which will come through. So I suspect this will be one, certainly again, to, to Councillor Abs's points, by the time we get to quarter three and quarter four, I would expect to see quite a lot of vol volatility around the capital programme. One from uh, actually being able to obtain some of the materials to deliver the capital programme, and then secondly, around some of those change cost estimates, which 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 do come through, and, and, and clearly any further delay is just going to see some of those costs rising through. And you'll start to see that more as we bring that longer-term capital programme over the next five to ten years uh, coming through to full council in March. Thank you. I've got Councillor Linden. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, in reference, when we were discussing on revenue uh, with uh, what's going on in future years, which, uh, Joseph, you've kindly gone on to, um, I know what Her Majesty's Government does when they have a problem with funding their budgets and overspends. Are we going to be risking... Um, that we may have to delay or uh, put back some of our uh, uh, capital projects so to be able to fund them, especially if we have uh, increased uh, interest costs on the public loans workforce board, sorry, for uh, future capital investment. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, through you, Chairman uh, Councillor Linden. Um, we we I mean we always monitor the the, the capital uh, strategy to see how we can balance out some of those costs of capital financing with some of the increased or sometimes decreased uh, costs that come through. I think perhaps you'll see some of that reprofiling where it happens. Uh, probably more likely to see that through at full council in March when we have a look at that five-year capital programme uh, and the availability of uh, uh, some of our supply chain and some of those uh, pressures over the next five years. So in the, I think it's probably in the longer term that we we'll see, we'll see some of this more likely uh, that we might see some changes uh, as, a, as a result of inflation. Um, but as you can see in some of the graphs it, it, that we do include within this paper, our previous strategy a few years ago was very much to borrow over the longer term um, and we do have a potential and again it depends on the size of the capital program over the next five ten years that actually as we have that underlying borrowing need to uh, increases that actually we borrow short term because we start to pay off some some greater levels of a debt uh, over the next five to ten years so if we if we go down that approach of mixing our borrowing more between shorter and longer term borrowing uh, than perhaps we have done previously, there is a bit of an opportunity on the revenue budget uh, to make a bit uh, make a saving there as, as shorter term borrowing uh, is a bit cheaper. But it but so much of this is geared around the macro economy as well and 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 uh, borrowing rates and other investors who are potentially coming in like the UK infrastructure bank as well. Um, which may well be able to well, well trip it out, offer slightly cheaper rates for some of our schemes uh, that we're looking to undertake. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Councillor Vickers, Tony. Yeah. yeah, my attention is drawn to para 72 on page 36. I'll read the sentence before I ask the question. The impact uh, of construction inflation we're talking about is that current contracts are subject to reduction in scope to deliver within agreed financial terms and tender costs for new projects subject to significant increases. Now, I understand that. My concern is where you're talking about a reduction in scope. That may save money on the capital budget, only to increase it in future years on a revenue budget. 
The example being, if you cut the spec of road surfacing so that it costs, you get stay within budget this year in the capital spend, but it's not gonna last so long, you're not actually spending. So I'm wondering what scope we have within these contracts, because we don't have specific examples of the contracts that are being affected. We have scope to renegotiate contracts, maybe resulting in increased cost of current contracts, but nevertheless, if you're looking at the long life, the, over the long term, not subjecting ourselves to an increase in spite. Uh, typically, I mean, builders are building houses now based upon, hopefully, some sort of estimate of the energy costs to the occupiers, which have gone through the roof. Now, if we'd known when we designed the house that it was going to cost a lot more to heat, might we not have put in more insulation? Or maybe we wouldn't, because we're only looking at selling houses as a capital investment rather than as somewhere you've got to actually live in and spend your money on or out of your salary going forward. So what how do we do that? Is what what scope is there for actually moving a saving in revenue costs over future years into renegotiating a capital cost in the current year? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair, uh, through you, Chairman and, uh, and Councillor Vickers, for that. So I, I think it's sort of two points that I, I try and answer uh, through that. So th the, the second one, we are always looking to the capital programme where we can generate revenue savings. And you can see there's some items in there um, uh, in the existing uh, capital programme where we are looking at a range of, of items around, up around sort of adult social care and care facilities where we can invest capital to drive out revenue saving. I don't think we'd ever want to go to go. Uh, away from that. I think though specifically around your sort of question around what's, what's in that paragraph um, around scope and cost, a lot of the projects that we've got in training at the moment in the capital programme would have been tendered a few weeks, months ago. So that's why we're not necessarily seeing such an immediate pressure, perhaps a bit in, in, in some areas where we have sort of term maintenance, for example. But um, a lot of those projects will have already been procured already in 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 training you can hold the contract to that to that price i think where we where we see more of an issue in the capital strategy will be as we come out of the next few months and into the next sort of five to ten years because you know, if inflation is running at 15 20 percent for some materials cost you, you you don't need to be a local government accountant to realize okay right well, well costs are going up something's going to have to be change because of that either you know additional borrowing or maybe additional grants that we can get in or or or, or, or a rescoping of that scheme and that's certainly something that we'll be looking at to bring forward uh, to members coming through to the to the march uh, uh, full council and and capital strategy for the five ten years ahead okay uh i see councillor mckinnon's hand up is that just to wrap it up uh, councillor because i have a question first you know to you go first, Chairman. I'll go first. Thank you very much. Um, it, I was just looking at the uh, on page 31, the table expenditure. We're planning to just short of three million to be spent on renewable energy provision. Yet I saw somewhere in the revenue report that uh, our income from solar was rather disappointing. Uh, Anyone care to comment on that? Why is it disappointing? Are we certain that we're going to make the numbers that we are planning to invest three million in? Please. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. So on that, so yes, it absolutely right. You see, in the in in the revenue budget, in the short term, um, we have had less income coming through on solar. Um, we haven't. Uh, delivered the level of schemes and it, it actually comes back to the site to, to Councillor Vickers's point we haven't delivered the level of schemes that we're anticipating to do to generate that income so in the short term you'll, you know, you see here this pressure you see a budget adjustment for next year whilst we can't catch up and deliver more solar PV schemes to get that income back. So, up. so it wasn't so, we actually had the, the solar there, no, but it, we, we just didn't get the money we expected. It's we haven't actually built it out. We haven't built it out okay. as, as, as much. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. Councillor McKinnon, do you want to wrap up? Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. And um, really, it was just to come back on Councillor Vickers, Vickers' question about if we chop a capital scheme 
will that have a knock-on effect, a, a negative knock-on effect in the revenue budget? Um, where you have an invest escape scheme or a capital scheme that's going to generate income, you know, that would not be at the top of the list for reprofiling. It would kind of defeat the purpose, you know, if, in the nicest possible way. So, no, I'd give you that assurance there. You know, much of the capital programme involves expense in the revenue budget via the, the capital financing cost. But, you know, if, if we're going to see a benefit in the revenue budget, then, you know, it would be all systems go. Thank you. Well, thank you, members. That was a that was an interesting and useful debate, and uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, that will improve the quality of the the discussion and debate when it gets to executive in a week or so's time. So, thank you for that. Okay, I'm now going to go back to uh, I think we're at nine o'clock. I'm going to go back to item eight, uh, which is the economic development strategy. I'd like to uh, have a look at that. Uh, item nine. Uh, I think I want to comment on that when we look at the forward plan. I think item nine, we will defer until the next meeting. I think that's, I'll explain later why I think that makes sense. Um, so the economic development strategy and operational review, uh, Eric and uh, Catherine, to, uh, which, which of the two of you is going first? I'll, I'll go first, if that's all right with you, Chair. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. All right, thank you. Excellent. Um, so, Chair, um, the Commission asked to review progress um, on implementing the Economic Development Strategy. Uh, so what we've done is we've reviewed the refresh version, which was approved in June 2021, uh, which you may recall um, was intended to uh, deal with uh, some of the challenges uh, being brought forward by COVID. So in August 2022, we published that review um, and it highlights really um, the significant amounts of grant funding um, that has been administered through the um, economic development team. Uh, we've paid out significant amounts of money in business grants, and we have administered uh, government supplied money as well, uh, also in town centres. Um, we have successfully um, put together a bus Business West Berkshire website, uh, which is the first of a number of initiatives uh, around encouraging investment in West Berkshire, which we are taking forward to an, in an investment strategy um, in, the, in this current year. Um, we have uh, brought forward the Newburytown Centre Vision and Master Plan, um, and we're currently working up uh, a project, um, one of the first quick win projects on Newby Wharf. Um, we've done a lot, a lot of work in supporting employment, uh, working with the Department for Work and Pensions, particularly through Kickstart, which was another COVID initiative, um, and also working um, with the Skills and Enterprise Partnership chaired by Newbury College. Um, and we're very proud to be sponsoring a STEM zone in their forthcoming um, careers fair um, next month. Um, we're looking uh, to work up, uh, more, work more closely with our rural businesses uh, and are currently planning a conference in November. And of course, all this all the way through, we've been building relationships uh, with both services, both, both within the council and also external uh, groups, for example, the Chambers of Commerce, to work together to engage with local businesses. So I know it's it's quite late. Um, I'm not going to go on any further. Um, I've uh, with with. Uh, circulated for you the progress report and very happy to take any questions chairman yes thank you very much it was a, a very comprehensive report thank you uh i got councillor abs yeah thank you very much um there was a quick one on the you i think you mentioned the new business website and uh, i know I, uh, some colleagues of mine looked at that and they didn't uh, we we're kind of curious as to kind of why that got built out and the way it did and at the time it was looked at there, there was no linkage from things like linkedin and no, nothing from the main web Sharkshire site to it and vice versa so uh, that may have changed in the last um, last few days but um, maybe you can give me an update on that if you don't mind but secondly, I was looking at um, some of the, the graphics that's in, in the, the document itself. And it starts with 85,000, 700,000, 6.42 million, and, and so on and so forth. But if you look down later on page 67, I think it is, at, at the town centre footfall, and then look at um, the, the index, Ungford seems to remain relatively static. Um, and of course, um, if we then look at Newbury and Thatcham, oh dear. So we're, so I, I'm curious as to uh, how much of this money has actually been effective in, in terms of doing anything for the high streets, given Hungerford doesn't seem to have a problem maintaining its footfall, but everywhere else does. Thank you. Uh, 
Any comments and feedback on that? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Abs. Um, two very good questions. Um, the uh, Business West Berkshire website, um, we, I, it should have links to our social media feeds going through um, Twitter and uh, social media, etc. So I will double check that because that right. was certainly the intention. I did say LinkedIn. LinkedIn. The bit um, the most business people would use, then wouldn't, yeah. Yes, take that on board. I'll certainly take that back to the team um, where we look at linking into LinkedIn. Um, yeah, apologies for that. Um, and the other, I think, question was about, yeah, it, it's really interesting that graph. We've recently taken on a, a new, um, because we're trying to improve our evidence base and data, um, and we've recently um, taken on a new footfall um, uh, numbers provider, uh, which is based on mobile phone coverage. And we're actually engaged in, in going back to the provider, which is Hook, um, to ask them how that happened, because we were as surprised as you were to, to see the, those figures, um, because actually they don't quite match what we're hearing from what we know the Newbury bid are um, uh, saying in terms of increased footfall. Um, and when Newbury Town Centre itself was one of the um, top performing um, town centres, um, certainly towards the end of last year. So we definitely do need to um, put in a bit more scrutiny to those graphs, but we felt it was worth um, publishing them, um, even if only to, to, um, to, to, to uh, encourage people to ask questions. Sorry, but um, I guess that will be up to the executive to, if they want to put that kind of positive, negative messaging out there. Um, I, I think with that, until you have an explanation and or can explain it properly, that's rather dangerous to go out with such big revenue spends with um, apparent um, drops in footfall. Okay. Well, well, to be clear, the money that was spent in the town centres um, was welcome back fund money, which came from the government as part of the COVID recovery. Um, so it wasn't council money. And in fact, um, it was we used our partnership working with Newbury Bid and also Thatch and Town Council put forward schemes uh, to spend that money, uh, which we were happy to support them in doing. And we directly funded um, projects um, put forward by Hungerford Town Council as well. So it was kind of based on the schemes that they put forward in terms of what money was spent in those particular town centres using that funding stream. I'm obviously quite glad it's not West Berkshire money directly, but it's still the uh, taxpayers' money. Whether I, 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 I think there's some validity in uh, in some sort of analysis comparing, if you've said what the bid are saying, uh, certainly our own car park revenues reflecting less people visiting in cars would support these graphs. So uh, it's uh, it's something I think you know. There's a few questions there that perhaps. I'm little, point you in the direction of asking some questions and research, Catherine. We ask that, that's very helpful. Thank, thank you. Councillor Vickers. Yeah, I, I was uh, struck by something you said, which actually I, I can't rem remember reading in the report, which was a, a good report. Um, you, you said there was a, an, an event coming up, I think you said in November, was it a rural business forum? I mean, I pricked up my ears because I'm supposed to be our group's countryside um, portfolio holder, shadow portfolio holder, and I'm aware of the massive changes coming through in, in the whole rural economy through post-Brexit and environment and climate change. Will members be um, welcomed at, at that forum just to... I, I, Sorry, through, through your chair. Absolutely. Um, the only reason we haven't um, published it yet is because the date keeps changing. Um, <laughs> so apologies. We will definitely be coming out very soon um, with, with invitations to that. Um, it's certainly something that we've been working up um, with the help of some um, rural businesses to just sense check the kind of things we're wanting to do and, and hoping that it, it, it kind of, you know, will, will raise interest. So, yes, more to come on that. It's about that. I was aware that something was happening in this area from a discussion I had with Sue Halliwell a few months ago, but looking forward to it. Councillor Cole. Thank you, Chairman. Um, may I first take the opportunity of commending you to Hungerford and its, its, its market in particular, which does go from strength to strength. Nevertheless, that wasn't what I was going to talk about. Um, there's one graph in this document I didn't understand how an affordable housing completion can dip below zero. Um, 
it sort of felt like knocking down built houses. And I'm sure it's not that. Uh, I'm sure it's not either, Councillor Cole. Um, regrettably, not being a housing expert, um, I can't provide you the answer right now, but I will certainly uh, go back and talk to our, uh, I think it's probably the planning department that's come from. So um, I will go and double check because it does look odd. Thank you. In actual fact, I think we did get rid of some of the uh, our, our, our own rented accommodation. That, that may well be it. Just a stone's throw from here. Just right? a stone's throw from here, correctly. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I'm only guessing. But yeah, go and find out. Uh, okay. Councillor Beck, uh, I, I got to say, Councillor Beck, as you're a, a guest here, not a member of OSMC, you're not actually entitled to ask any questions unless you've asked me beforehand. But I'll be very kind to you tonight. Ask your question, please. You've got your hand up at the moment. Oh, oh okay. Is that? Uh... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. That's no problem. Okay, no problem. No problem. Okay. Right. Uh, I have a question for you, Catherine. Uh, and those of you who were here when we went through the uh, the first reiteration of this a strategy at OSMC and KPIs. Um, I insisted and it was agreed there'd be a KPI along the lines of um, we would visit the senior management of the top 10 employers or businesses at least once a year. I was surprised not to see that in this report. What's happened to that KPI? Because the background to that was it is, most, it is almost maybe even more important to keep our current businesses engaged and happy than it is to get new ones. Uh, Chairman, um, in response to that, um, I am not sure what happened to that. Um, I came into the role in April 21, uh, but I can assure you that we are certainly um, engaging with um, our top 10 employers on a number of levels um, from um, you know, executive and, and chief executive executive level down. Um, in terms of the top 10 employers, it's quite interesting. I mean, as you, I'm not, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, I'm sure, but AWE and Vodafone right up there at the top um, and a number of large um, supermarkets actually, because the number of uh, supermarkets we have through the West Berkshire um, actually make, means that they are in, um, in the top 10 employers. Um, so it's, it's not that we're not um, engaging with them and talking to them, we certainly are. Um, but I will go back and, and check um, what's happened to that KPI. Because the KPI was absolutely to make sure we were we, we were keeping our eye on that and keeping track of it, uh, because I know in the past we haven't been. Uh, so I'd really appreciate you uh, you looking into that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKinnon. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and um, thanks, Catherine, for, for that report. Um, I would echo the comments of, of a number of members here today. It's a very informative and well put together report. And I'll, I'll close just by saying uh, to, to Tony, so Councillor Vickers, uh, members more than welcome at our Rural Business Conference. We are about to, to, to publicise the details and, and get some invitations out. So look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so let me add uh, my thanks as well, Catherine. Thank you very much. Quite, quite comprehensive. Apart from that KPI that was missing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. I'll, I'll pass that on to the team. Very much a, a team effort there. Thank you. Good, good, good. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, we're moving right along. Uh, we go on to item 12, which is task and finish groups update. And I'd like to invite Councillor James Cole to provide an update on the activities and reporting on the customer journey task group. I'll be brief. Uh, we no. have gone a long way into a very wide subject. Uh, the subject seems to have got wider and wider. You want us to finish uh, by OSMC of late November. I would like to publicly ask for a further extension. We've learned an awful lot in this. There's an awful lot that's come to light and still coming to light. Uh, I would say that it is worth extending for one more OSMC period. Uh, 
But it's your call, Chairman. Fine. I, I, uh, uh, it's the first I've I've heard of it, although I've had a, the, the ruins and the, the, the feelings and the, uh, the, 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 there have been uh, rumblings in the force, shall I say, I felt that way. Can I make a suggestion that yourself, uh, Gordon, myself, and uh, Councillor Abs as, as deputy, as vice, we can we, we we have a chat, probably just a just a Zoom, uh, and to discuss that. I, I'm all for putting it another three months if the you know if, if that's going to make the quality there. And there's no sense cutting it short just for the sake of it. But I'd like to understand a little bit more about where the scope is uh, is increasing. Okay. I think that's an excellent idea. I don't think we've actually changed the the scope okay, of the document let, as written. Well, let us understand some of the reasons why you think we need to have an extra three months. We can do that. Uh, we, we should probably try to arrange that as soon as possible. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm on that committee the, at the moment, yeah, so, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm <laughs> so I'm contributing to it. I, I do agree. I agree with James. There's, there's a lot of work yet to do, although I, I would have personally like us to give some preliminary findings as soon as possible, because there are some obvious wins that we can do, okay. um, but we can discuss that. Well, the four, the, the four of us should discuss that. We can. I think I'll get Gordon to try and organise a, a Zoom to, to, to go around that. Thank you. Okay. We, we did, in fact, suggest that. Okay. That we should put forward a uh, an interim report for the end of November. Okay. Okay. Right. And uh, anything on the fees and charges? Yes, Chairman. Uh, things are now moving. Um, I've had a pre-meeting with Gordon today and we've come to the same conclusion that we'd find it very challenging to complete that by November. There is an awful lot of work to be done um, and obviously we don't go off in tangents. Uh, I've spoken to three out of the four members more recently, we're having our first meeting on the uh, 15th of September. So obviously we want it concise. Obviously it depends on officer input. Um, we're going to be asking uh, certainly one of the witnesses for uh, Ross McKinnon to be uh, present. But it, it's, it's getting it done uh, in time. And there is also quite a lot of work and its staff resources is always a concern yeah and um uh, for other work as well that uh, some of the officers have to do well, I, I, at least i understand the fully understand the reason it's a you know it's been a late start to get this going i, so. I agree chairman but okay. th th there is the staff resource which is also concerned that you might well, want to raise if, elsewhere. If, if yeah, well, we should probably the three of us have a chat about that pretty quick because we might have to shake a few trees. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, when, but... when I've got lots of people telling me how important OSMC is, I think we ought to get the resource to support it. Okay. Thank you very much, Chairman. Good. Okay. Thank you for that update. Uh, next item uh, is Councillor Bennyworth giving us a. Uh, Health Scrutiny Committee update. Dennis. Thank you, Chairman. These are the words of Councillor Claire Rolls, Chairman of the Health and Scrutiny Committee. Firstly, my apologies for not being able to attend today's OSMC uh, and update members in person. Our last Health Scrutiny Committee meeting took place on the 14th of June with representatives from Elysium Healthcare uh, coming before the committee to provide an update on the response to the Care Quality Commission report and plans for future investment at Thornford Park Hospital. Representatives from Royal Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust also attended the meeting to provide an update on current performance regarding waiting times and referrals and the mitigation measures introduced for cancer treatment. Our next meeting will be held on the 20th of September with the South Central Ambulance Service and West School and out of our services on the agenda, along with our standing agenda items, integrated care board group update and health watch update. We're also in the process of setting up a task and finish group to look at the provisions of healthcare serving new developments. On the 22nd of July, Councillor Linden and I attended an informal Buckingham, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire 
and Berkshire West Joint Health and Adult Social Care Select Committee meeting at Buckinghamshire Council offices. The meeting was also attended by councillors from Wokingham. We found the meeting very helpful as an opportunity to share forthcoming health scrutiny items and to learn how other councils approach committee meetings and best practice. We had a discussion about experiences of working with ICS colleagues, including local CCGs, and shared inf information on the newly created ICB, ICP, and place-based partnerships. We also had a discussion about the potential areas of work for the uh, Bob JH OSC. The minutes of the meeting can be made available if any member would like to see them, and a further meeting is planned in September or October. That concludes the report, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Anyone, any questions, Tony? Just an information item. We are also going to have a visit to the Royal Berkshire Hospital because of the potential redevelopment plan, and we've got two dates uh, planned uh, either this month or next month to go, go there, Chairman, which would be very okay. useful. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Dennis, and uh, you pass thanks on to Councillor Rolls as well. Uh, right, getting towards the, the tail end. Item 14, the West Berkshire Forward Plan, pages 105 to 120. Uh, members, <laughs> the note here in front of me is, says, is quite accurate. Members are invited to note the items on the forward plan to consider whether OSMC wishes to review any of these items prior to the relevant meeting where the decision will be made. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at the forward plan, the only meetings that we can get ahead of the game on are starting on pages 118. <laughs> uh, now, it's, it's one of the issues uh, I have uh, had meetings with the, the consultants who uh, uh, were looking at our governance. Uh, I've also had uh, discussions with the chief executive and also the leader. Uh, to, for, for us to affect this, we need a forward plan, which is much more forward, probably by an extra six months. Uh, and uh, so it's all been agreed in principle. It's a matter of getting it, getting it done. It will probably not take place until the next, uh, the next fiscal year. Now, the only, if you look, if those of you who have looked at the, the, the items, uh, there is one uh, which is on February the 9th, the North and East Thatcham Flood Alleviation Scheme. Now, that's one of the other reasons I wish to defer the flood strategy to the OSMC in November, because those two things go hand in hand in glove. So I think we should be uh, uh, broadening the flood strategy to, in, to include the, uh, specifically include this uh, plan going to executive. Uh, on this 9th of February for a review. Okay. Do we all agree that? I see a few nods. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Anything else on the forward plan? No? Fine. Good. Uh, the work program immediately falls out of that then. And the work program, uh, I guess we, we add into the, uh, the November meeting, the flood and North Thatcham. Uh, and, uh, and that's it really. Uh, possibly with an interim report coming on uh, the task group uh, for uh, the customer journey. Uh, you're probably not going to be in a position for an interim, Tony, on fees and charges. Right. You will not probably be a, in a position to do an interim on fees and charges. Um, I haven't actually raised that with uh, Gordon. Gordon, do you want to comment on that at all? I, I think once we've scoped out the, the work programme, we'll be in a better position to, to comment. Yeah, we're going to a short intro. Yeah, we're okay. doing that on the Monday 15th. Sure. Okay, so that's all we are. And the, uh, uh, the, the obviously, the, the appraisal system review, which was in this schedule for next year, will also come into November. But, but 10 and 11 will be cut short. And we'll add the flood and we add the appraisal system. Any other comments, views? No. Okay, well, that was a long one tonight, but I, I thought, I don't know about you, I actually enjoyed the Thames water one. I think it was, uh, it was a good presentation. Uh, not just yet, no, I'm just sorry. And, uh, 
yeah, and uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, it was a very productive meeting. So thank you, everyone. And the next one is 29th of November. With that, I'll close the meeting. <laughs>